Everybody, you're listening to the Comic Book Bears podcast. I'm Bill Zanowitz. I'm Steve Morey. And I'm Caleb Alexander McKenzie. And we are your hairy, heavy homos that talk about comic books, but you don't have to be a hairy, heavy homo to listen in or possibly stream in. I mentioned hair and I kind of took a pause there because two of us have a lot less now. One got de Jufroed and I got de Farad. Um, so. <laughs> Oh, ah. oh, it was, it was so clapping. unwieldy. Oh my god. Like when Tito my friend Tito um yeah. visited the, the New York area and I spent two days with him. And but like he told me I had to keep the hair, you know, like that was his vote to keep the hair. And it, like boo boy, that next day zzz. it was gone. Oh my it god. Buzzed. It's just tough to maintain it, man. It's really tough. I yeah. It, I think that's it, it, believe at age fifty six, I'm lucky to have that problem. I'm very, yeah, very lucky. It, it looks really good, like when you grow it out, though. It really does. Oh, thank you. I like it. I I like it both ways. I love it buzzed. I think it's awesome. Uh, and but when it gets longer, like you you go through like the the different phases. You go through like the the Kenny Rogers phase, which yeah. is like. Mwah. Um, yes, yeah. and then of course the fair hair, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Kenny, the Kenny oh, Rogers that. face really is my favorite of all the, the Bill okay. hairstyles, like of, okay. of all the hair accessories that, that the build all comes with. It really is the Kenny Rogers, <laughs> but I mean, like, I, like there's, there's something to be said for the buzz cut, too. So, yeah, that, that could be the tagline from Rogers to Rollins, yeah, yeah, there you yeah. Go. I mean, <laughs> I mean buzz, buzz cuts. You know, bohawks, mohawks, all over here. Yeah. yeah, please. And your hair looks really good, Steve. I like, I like what Jason. Well, thank does. you. Yeah, yeah. So, Jason, uh, Jason does an amazing job, which is why, like, when he had said, while he, well, he was out in Colorado, he was like, "Oh, you should just go and find somebody to do it." And I was like, "Okay." And you know, I asked <laughs> around and, um, you know, got some recommendations. But of course, everybody was like booked out until April anyway. Which really? I was like, I, I was kind of relieved. I could have gone to like a, a great clips at any time, but I've been there before, and you know the choppy choppy is no goody goody. So yeah. at uh, at any of the great clips great I've ever clips been to. in town closed, and they were good. Oh, lucky! Pretty good, yeah. I get the people super, who are like, "This is my town." Job. La bamba, la bamba. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> We, we we had a sport clips and for the longest time that's where I would go because there was a the, the I would go to see the same woman every time she was an older woman she could do an amazing fade I loved her like she could hold her own against anybody and then she moved to Texas of all places and so I had to go search and find a new a new barbershop luckily I did find one super awesome it's not far from where I live um mm-hmm. that just I, I just really enjoy going there now so a good barbershop is worth its weight in gold it really is Oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. When I was yeah. working in Newark, um, you know, great places to eat, but there's also like a barber shop on every other co- uh, on every other street. Yeah, That's- it's a lot of old Colombian and Brazilian guys, and they would do the thing with the um, with the hot towel and then the hot cream on the back of the neck and oh my that's it's a sexual experience as far as I'm concerned. I mean, who could say no to hot cream on the back of the neck? Oh, Steve. He went. He, you knew he was going to. I knew. I knew. It's my fault. There was no. There was no way it was not going to happen. I drove right into that ditch, and I shouldn't collect yeah. insurance on it. Yeah. <laughs> the ditch next to the gutter. 
but really we've been gone for three weeks. We had uh, last week off, but luckily uh, we are in a month that has five Thursdays. So you yeah. still got us like sort of. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're, still, we're still meeting the quota. Yeah, we're, we we're are. Still, we're still going to make our we two are. episodes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. The so crush in, that, like, it's great. in that three weeks, how have you guys been? I've been good. I've been busy as hell. Yeah. I've been busy as hell. And, you know, I was telling Steve before you got on Caleb, like yesterday was one of those, you know, I haven't signed into LinkedIn in a while. You know, (laughs) Uh, (laughs) it was like one of those, you know, uh, I wonder if I still have a ladders account, you know. Um, But uh, today was better. But it's just, it, it's not bad. It's just busy. Yeah. It's just so busy. And it's just, yeah. there's a a big Groundhog Day component of what we're doing right now. And the end's in sight, but it's, I'm reliving the same day again and again, pretty much. So. Yeah. And everyone I've worked with is in the same boat. So it's, yeah. you know, it's not like uh, some people have a, an advantage of, you know, but that's you know I'm also I'm also in consulting and I know this is there it, it's finite you know and whatever comes next is going to be you know in the same business realm but it'll be different and right. yeah. that's uh, that's uh, a saving grace at points yeah yeah well, Roger and I had our nieces up last week for the spring break hotness, uh, so as we usually do. So we had the, we had teenage girls in the house for nine days, and it is both. Uh, it was the best of times and the worst of times. Uh, it, it's super fun, but it's it's exhausting. And if you're like me, like I'm a very uh, particular kind of guy, and I like my space and I like my quiet. Uh, like I like to, you know, wake up and have coffee and listen to music and and do that stuff. And just when you have people in your space for that long, it can be very just like nerve wracking and not in a bad way. Like nothing bad is happening, but it's just like, hey, things are different. And you're out of your routine. Uh, but there was lots of movie watching. We went and saw Dune two again, uh, which was great because we got them to watch that. We watched wow. all of the. Well, I let me rephrase that. We watched the first three Matrix movies, which, as far as I'm concerned, is the only Matrix movies that were made. I, this last thing they made doesn't exist. And then uh, just we found uh, on the Nintendo Switch, there was like a thing that we could get for free that has like all of the Super Nintendo, Nintendo, Atari, every like just thousands of games. Um, and so we downloaded that and like we played OG, OG Mario, OG Tetris for hours and hours and hours. Dr. Mario. It was It was fun times. So that was just like in-depth nerd stuff. And and the kids are in that cool stage where they're like they're discovering music, like really discovering it. So I was just like, in my, like we were just going like, I was like, Oh, you like that? Well then here's these seven other people you need to know. Uh, And it was like new stuff, old stuff. So it was just very much like, let me, let me teach the next generation. And the next generation was like, no, dude, we don't care. We just want to listen and go get ice cream. Like, like we don't, we don't need you to expound on this. We're good. But I was just like, no, this will, this will treat you good someday. Um, And I've got to do my full sermon. I have to do my full sermon. Do not, do not cut my sermon short. <laughs> so, but we I saw just, my first uh, concert since November. Nice. Um, that was that's good. cool. Porno for Pyros on the, the final date of their farewell tour. Um, you know, we all know how that works out sometimes. So with, yeah. you know, <laughs> I've seen a few bands on three farewell tours. Uh, so. How many times do we have to say goodbye to Cher? I yeah. don't know. At least, the like turtles, at least the turtles were honest about it, because after a point, this is like their fourth annual farewell tour. You know? So the, the, sometimes there's, there's folks that are honest about it, but um, yeah, yeah. Well, but there are, there are some groups I think are done. Like I think we're going to get a very definitive end statement from the Who at some point this year. Um, I yeah. think so. Yeah, yeah. I, I think there are some groups that, you know, even without, even if it's not because of, uh, you know, losing a band member or something that, you know, it's just, you know, age provides the bands are a finite thing. And it's, uh, it's weird. Yeah, I was, 
I was it's talking really with weird. somebody. I was talking with somebody just the other day, and like I actually genuinely think Kiss is done. I, I, like I, I think Kiss is done. Yeah. And they were because everybody else is like, oh no, they're they're gonna do another thing. And I was like, I, I don't feel it this time. Yeah. Like I, I think that yeah. they're done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So and I wouldn't be surprised if we, you know, I mean, we may see Gene Simmons come out and do appearances and stuff, but I don't, I don't think we're gonna see, uh, see them at least Gene and Paul on stage again together. Yeah. No. No, I don't. I don't think so. I think they made that. <clears throat> they made that sort of like step into the digital realm uh, with their, I guess, with the promotional thing or whatever. But it's probably just going to be from now on just just a way of repackaging all of the old music and you know old concepts, animation. You don't need them. You don't need the, them the anymore. Thing is, like, how them. many acts are on that ABBA level that yeah. people would see it? You know. Yeah, and part of it is because we didn't have ABBA as a touring act, you know, since 1980. Right. Um, I don't know. I mean, I th I think a genuine Beatles avatar would do like amazing business. I think there's some acts where that like a Jimi <laughs> Hendrix experience. I think there's some, but it would still be, you know, this would be the interest, you know, at at point one, and then after point, it will retract. And See, that's yeah. definitely be. Yes. I wonder about I wonder about that though because I was actually kind of surprised at the reaction about the the last you know the Beatles song the final Beatles song that came out where they took it you know they took all the things you know it got a lot of hype for about a week and then after that you started hearing a lot yeah. of criticism about it um, and I just like the the reaction was not what I thought it would be because I thought it would be cool you know like hey this really is the last thing that they did they put it together and then they used AI just a little bit but they didn't use AI to like invent new stuff they just used it to kind of mesh everything. But people really didn't, after the first week, people really didn't get into it that much. Well, except for that guy. But anyway. Oh, well, I mean, <laughs> that's what, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, think we're, I think we're in a very different music landscape anyway. Like anything in the 21st century now, if you are a band that's putting out something big, it'll be hyped up. But there's so much else going on. I mean, people have exposure and the ability to listen to anybody they want at any time. And so I think that there's there will always be mega stars. There will always be sort of like a big drop, a big release, yeah. you know, that'll happen. Mm -hmm. And it might continue throughout that oh, year. So but I then, have to say, as I've gotten older, I have such a skewed idea of who's big. Yeah. yeah. Like in the New York area, uh, Cigarettes After Dark, who's a band I like, are playing Madison Square Garden. This is a band that's never crossed, the, like, they've never been in the, the, the Billboard. <laughs> <laughs> They've never been there. They've like I think their highest charting album is like 132. Yeah. And huh. I I don't understand that. You know, I don't I don't have a good gauge of of what is big. Um hmm. I, I, it's it's just it's just strange because it, you know there's also like um I can't you know, believe and, and I can't like believe Steve right the social side. media like you, you think of a song like um Lil Boo thing like I thought that guy would be like in, like hugely big and he is a blip. I forget his um, name. Um, I, you know, so yeah. I think I think part of it is also because you know most music listeners now, or like anybody, any consumer of music, hmm. can exist in their own. I don't want to use the word bubble because bubbles make it sound like really like insular and uh, you know. Yeah. But really, I mean, you curate your own music experience. I mean, it's it's easy to kind of like through Spotify, you know, or, you know, playlists and things like that. People can introduce you to new bands and music. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of times we kind of now have the ability to just listen to whatever we want, whatever we want. And so we want to find bands that are most like what we like to listen to. Not to say that we can't get introduced to anything cool, but, you know, it's I think it's, it's harder really to like really make make an impact on a grand scale you have your fans your fans are very loyal but like really expanding that pool to a point where you have like a big cultural phenomenon it's hard to do you've got your taylor swift and your beyonce's yeah but you've got some amazing acts and some amazing bands that they have hardcore fans but they're not going to be on the level of like a rolling stones or 
even a Creedence yeah. Clearwater revival, you know, like who is <laughs> something like that, that people in 30 years are going to be like, oh my God, that band defined this generation, you know, or that band, like that, I hear that song and everybody has the same sort of like cultural memory experience of it. So uh, for a lot of, for other, a lot of things, I mean, there are, you know. Yeah. It's, it's very algorithmic, right? Like it when, when the way that we curate, but on the other side of that coin, um, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about my dad and his band who just like charted the highest that they ever have. Yeah. Judas Priest. So, you know, like <laughs> that, that are just no, their, their, their no. album. It's like second no. highest or something like that. Isn't it? I don't think so. Oh, this one's hitting like critical acclaim. Like they're, they're charting billboards. It's, it's top doing, it's, and it did, yeah. it did, it's the best charting album for theirs in England. Okay. Maybe that's um, what I saw. It then. came in at number two. So maybe that, but, um, but I know that I'm, I'm, I know Firepower and Angel of Retribution came in higher at the very least. Uh, but um, in terms of physical you sales, you're like, you're like number one, like in a big way. Yeah. 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 It's, it's like blowing up in the coolest. Still place. a number one, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's still a number one. But... Well, when they put out the next Christmas album, you know. Well, All right. Was fun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we'll maybe a little later when we get to our, our geek gets. Yep. So I'll say. Yeah. All right. We've had some news. Um, why don't oh, we start boy. with the less controversial bit? Um, Steve, do you want to talk about the new X Men titles that were announced at uh, and a, a very cool venue to announce in South by Southwest? Yeah. So, like, it was kind of wild that they you know, that Marvel would announce it at a, you know, a music and a film festival, but, eh, you know, hey, they've got the audience, most of the audience, most of the people who are going to this festival love the X-Men or know about the X-Men or, you know, it's not going to be completely out of place for them to be talking to these people, but um, they announced several uh, new books and hinted at some additional books that are going to be announced a little bit later on, probably uh, you know, I think like San Diego, there would probably be some additional books announced. Um, they were able to announce a few of the teams and a few of the new titles. Um, we've got the Uncanny X-Men, written by Gail Simone, which is nice to see her back on an X-Men book. We'll see how she does. I think that might be cool. Um, drawn by David Marquez. Um, you also have uh, just adjectiveless X-Men. Uh, is going to be written by Jen McKay. Um, and Ryan Stegman. And then we've also got uh, Exceptional X Men is making a comeback uh, with uh, Eve Ewing and Carmen Carnero. Um, I'm really happy to see Uncanny Dak. I, th- just nostalgia reasons. Um, I'm not exactly sure if they're going to go back to legacy numbering. I know that the last time they did, when they ended the last series, they ended it with. You know, the final issue, I think it was 600. Mm -hmm. I can remember. It depends how close they are to a number that ends in zero, zero. Yeah, I guess. I mean, you know. That's basically it. That's that's where they're going to throw it back on there. But, um, yeah, it's just nice to see that again, Uncanny. And then Adjective is X-Men. I never read Exceptional X-Men when it was, uh, when it first came out. The uh, the first volume. I think it's it's had two volumes. Um, But... Well, that's me. In any case, you know, for me, I was, I'm, I'm excited, but I'm also kind of disappointed because I'm kind of annoyed that we're still going to be seeing multiple X Men titles, an entire comic publisher's line of comics of X Men titles. Yeah, which um, always been. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's just so much. Uh, you know, uh, all the all the other books are ending. They are going to be ending um, before we go into the summer. But Wolverine's going to be back. Um, you know, there's going to be, I think, another Deadpool series. I think we've got got another X Force, another X Factor, kind of on the line. Um, you know, coming up as well. They did announce that. Um, there's a lot, and I, I like the I, I love X Factor again coming back because I love X Factor. But again, it's it's a lot of titles, and it's a lot to keep up with. And I think um, I appreciate what they're doing. And I appreciate that they're going in a completely new direction. We're going to be pro post Krakoa altogether. Um, I like some of the creative teams, but 
there's still too much. I'm not going to be able to read all these books. I'm, I have no interest in reading every title. I'm going to pick Uncanny, might go with X-Men, you know, plain X-Men, um, and I'll pick up X-Factor. And those, those three are Maybe Wolverine. I like Wolverine, but it's not just warm. just too much. There's too much. Okay. But I'm still excited. You know. <laughs> and, and I think it's also worth mentioning that uh, Tom Brevoort is going to be the editor. He's moving from the Avengers office yeah. to the X-Men office. Yeah. Um, I think no matter what you think about the guy, uh, you know, he was a factor in making the Avengers a premier franchise comic book wise. Yeah. You know, there Solid were times, editor. There were times it was an afterthought, you know. It was a right. time there were times before before Bendis and New Avengers number one that there was a book that people took as a concession instead of um instead of their first yeah. book. You know, so kind of a cut your teeth title or yeah. uh we don't know where to put you, let's just have you write this for a little while. <laughs> yeah. Or, I mean there's so many times after um you know i i liked i really liked jeff johns on it um i surprisingly liked chuck austin on it and i usually hated his stuff but i thought his at least his first two arcs were pretty good but it did like after 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 busick then johns it did feel like everything was a holding pattern until that's right i was sitting trying to remember when johns wrote it and it was after the busick the which is to to me that's my avengers right the busick perez avengers is my stuff so i just like i was trying to remember i I didn't do that and and then you get to the so the problem is the avengers suffers the same thing that x X-Men suffers from sometimes and it's not necessarily just that there's too many titles because there's only one Avengers title right but you've got Avengers you've got Thor Captain America you've got Iron Man you've got everybody gets their solo the Hulk right but it's that people often forget there is something in the makeup of those books right that makes it special if you look at going back to the X-Men right uncanny X-Men that's your that's your flagship team right X-Factor Peter David's X Factor was amazing. Like that, like Jamie Madrox is in my top ten of characters because of Peter David, right? It's 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 a it's phenomenal, right? But he I was made like, it. I, was, I call them Havoc's Debbie Downers. <laughs> but he yes, Havoc's Debbie Downers. I like that. Like, I'm going with it. <laughs> he made it something special, right? He made it something singular. Yeah. It, it, you could not take that book. It did not line up with the other books it, in continuity. No. It did, but right, it, it wasn't immersive. If you read Uncanny, right, like even even just you know a few months back, if you read X Men or, or you read X Factor or X Force, everything, there's nothing that makes those books singular. Like they could have just switched the titles. They, it's almost very formulaic. Each time, yes, yeah, so one of them's on Mars, the other one's doing some weird shit, but. Like there's nothing that makes it it stand out on its own that it needs to be its own book. They could have just made it a storyline. Yeah. And instead of going one storyline, they do yeah. these things. They do forty books and they run out of ideas for them. And they have to do a relaunch. That's the well, only I, thing I I'm think a little that's... apprehensive about the Brevert stuff because, um, and this may have been more Hickman than anybody. Like you can't if you threw me two issues and told me which one was Avengers and which one was New Avengers during Hickman's run, I couldn't tell you. No, yeah. but because they because they overlap, you had to you had to read them both at the same time. Whereas, yeah, for I mean, you know, and you know, prior to that, you had, you know, the first incarnation of New Avengers was radically different. Yeah, from what came before, and then when that became Avengers, and it was new, you know, there was a lot of variety between Initiative and Avengers Academy, and yeah, um, and things seemed to. And I, I will say with Avengers, they seem to know when to take their bow. Um, you know, when they've run out of ideas or they've told what unless, they needed to tell. In X Men, you don't always get that. <laughs> no, unless Jason Aaron's writing it, and then they give him about forty issues too many. Uh, so. Yeah. Well, well, and the thing with X Men up to this point, where you're talking about overlapping, overlapping, overlapping. Oh, you know this this title, this title. There's really no difference. To it, you know, yes, there's some characters that are yeah. unique, but they're all they're all playing in the same sandbox and they're yeah. all dealing with the same toys. And it's, it's just all an it's X-Men not team. It's yeah, it's all just X-Men. An X-Men team. Yeah. So, like, you know, when you're trying to to recommend X books to people, at least the past couple of years have been this way, where it's like, oh, 
you want to read Immortal X Men, but you want to read Immortal X Men between like this issue and this issue, <laughs> and then you want to pick up X Force, but you want to drop X Force after you get about fifteen issues in because then it gets like all like beast of the crap, you know, piece of crap, and blah, you know, it, it's just it's it's tough. It's tough to recommend books or even to you know jump on because there's so much that's happening and there's so much that's all interconnected that it's like oh, you know, I I stopped reading. Um, you know, I stopped reading X Fact. I stopped reading X Force for this amount of time, and then I went and picked up a, a book lately, and uh, I, I don't know what's going on. You know what what's what's happening with this? Or I've been reading the main X title, but I'm missing all this other stuff that's being referred to, and it's important that I know. And it, it, you know, it's it's tough, and I'm I'm hoping that they get away from that type of storytelling for at least a while with yeah. all these new X books, but well, given, yeah. given recent history, I would say, and by recent, I mean like the past 20 years uh, or even 30 years, the past 30 years of X books, uh, it, it doesn't stay disconnected for very long. Like you, you start having to pick everything up and read through everything in order to get the whole story. Well, at the end of the day, complain is, you know, I can complain all I want to about this, that, or the other. Marvel doesn't pay me. They don't They don't care, right? But it, what it boils down to is this. If you want to read every, every X-Men book, there's nothing wrong with that. Go go for it, right? And, and talk about what you love. Talk about what you don't love. Do You do you. I, my money only runs me so far every month. So I can't, I can't afford to buy the whole line. And so I'm going to pick and choose. And if you want me to pick up a book out that, that, that is other than X-Men, right? If you want me to pick up one of the side books, then you've got to pitch me on it. You've got to sell me on it. And if, if at least from my vantage point, it looks like, okay, this is just another X-Men book. There's nothing that stands out about it. There's nothing that really draws me in. Then I can live without it and, and, and bless anybody who wants to pick it up and tell me. Uh Uh-oh. That's how he froze. <laughs> wow, that's a, that that's a that's a perfect image. I think I yeah. jammed yeah, up you, a little bit there. Yeah, you froze. Oh, there you me. go. I can hear you. Yeah, it was a great moving. pose, though, brother. It was. <laughs> but what what I was saying is, if you if you want me to pick up a book, then then make it stand out to me, and that will gravitate me to you know, uh, you Steve, you mentioned Immortal X Men. That's a book that I grabbed because it was something different, right? Ben Percy on a book is going to make me pick it up because yeah. for many reasons, but um, have you heard that man's voice? It's like sex. It's like audible sex. It's amazing. Um, have you seen that man? Oh my God. I would climb that tree anyway. Um, but, but that's, that's just what it, but since we're talking about X-Men, right. And we're talking about new things, uh, just, it's a good moment to interject and say, Hey, the new, the new X-Men animated feature or animated series has dropped have you guys checked that out at all the first two i haven't watched the third that just i haven't dropped. seen the third one yet either yeah i i have seen the third one um oh, yes. and the one criticism i have about it is that it wraps up the madeline Pryor gene gray story pretty quick uh but i am i am just happy that they are going there i'm happy um in this x-men 97 it's totally full of winks to everybody who's grew up watching the original one yeah um but at the same time there's also some maturity there there is some maturity in the storytelling the art is you know in the same style but it is not the same quality animation it is disney bucks uh yeah. better which is great um yeah i i mean i i really like it i i watch it as soon as uh it comes out on wednesday um so it's uh yeah very very you know, very close to my heart uh, when I was a kid, and uh, I'm happy it's back now, and I'm happy that they're telling the stories they are so far. So The one thing that I don't think has been discussed enough is the 97 version is really making me appreciate how good at their craft some of the voice actors were. They, yeah. You know, I just dismissed them in the 90s as, you know, maybe it is because it is there was a few step-ups in maturity. But you know, especially um, Allison Seeley Smith as Storm mm. and Cal Dodd as Wolverine. Um, maybe it's because they have material now that has a, a bit more bite to it. But yeah, uh, I, I gotta say, like I, you know, like I said, I dismiss them as you know, your working voice actors. You know, yeah. <laughs> there was a reason they weren't uh, um, 
Andrew Romano produced shows, you know, <laughs> voice directed shows. Um, but I'm really appreciating them more now, what they brought to mm-hmm. those characters. Well, and they, they do, like, the voices immediately take you back. When you hear them talk, you're like, oh, oh my God, I remember, you know. Um, and it's a good feeling. Like, the nostalgia wave is a real thing with it. But uh, they're not just relying on it, which is... Well, I also think good. the mechanism of literally taking it from the next day, yeah, yeah. Um, from where they left off, it works. It, they're not, yeah. It's not a reboot. It's, you know, it, it's a continuation. It's a continuation. And I, and I think that... Yeah. I think, and th- for this particular kind of project, it really works. Well, and yeah. so for me, like I was, I was growing up with this show, right? Like, I, I mean, so, so for me, the, the, vo- well, the voice of storm, right. That is the iconic sound of storm for me, because that is, that is the storm I heard in my formative years in 97, I was 10. So like that to me was, that's where, that's what those voices are. So what I th- the reason I say that is not for any age gap reasons though, but it's, you know, you guys were, you were, you were cognizant of voice actors at that time, right? Yeah. You understood what that was. I was a kid. I was a kid immersed in animation, right? Immersed in that world. And just like, I didn't understand the voice actors, the concept of it. These were just those characters. These were those characters with their voices being brought to life. And so that to me, it is Storm, right? That's her voice. Yeah. And so to hear that again, that the, just the way that it, she enunciates, the, the way that she puts certain you know words and she stresses certain syllables, that's what Storm sounds like when I read the comics. And yeah. so to do that again and to hear her her voice, and she's gotten older a little bit now, but to hear that, but, but it's still there. To me, it just it really does take. It's not even a nostalgia feel. It's like it's it's coming back home. Right? It's not not me reminiscing. It's just saying no. This is right. This is what it's supposed to sound like. This is Storm. This is this is Logan. Cyclops sounds great in the show as well, too. So, yeah. um, you know, that's, and, that's and a new me, actor because the original actor passed I was, away. Yeah, I was wondering about that because, yeah. but, but but it's very close. He's damn close. Yeah, he's very yeah. close. He's damn close. Yeah. But one of the one of my favorite things about the original series is that it does take these storylines and it condenses it a little bit. I mean, you get the brood, you get the um, you know the the days of future past in, in like two episodes. So it doesn't surprise me to, to what Steve was saying that they wrap up the Madeline Pryor storyline really quick. That's kind of what the show did. They gave you all these big hallmark series or hallmark moments of the comic, and they just kind of condensed it. So I yeah. like you know. I don't know how long they can do that because eventually you're going to catch up, but they can do it for a while. And it's funny well, because the that, that show crossed over was the Spider-Man 94 yeah. series. Uh, and the Spider-Man was the exact opposite. They would take like one issue and that would be like half a season. Uh, yeah, this, <laughs> this ain't Dragon Ball Z where they spend five episodes doing this. Yeah. <laughs> like the recap is five minutes long. Then you have like some flashy build up, And then next time, <laughs> no, I, I think I think it's still really good. Plus, they made some interesting choices because obviously the show is not it's patterned. It's based on those original stories um, and up to, you know, literally up to uh, probably season four. It was just all Claremont stories. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, they have made some changes. They've made some art, taken some artistic license um, and narrative license with how they present. Um, some of these characters and some of these storylines. And I think that, you know, it makes it something that's unique, even though it's, it's, it's giving us stories that we know that we kind of, that we understand that are part of the DNA and the X-Men, but it's presenting them in a, in a different way where you don't necessarily know exactly what's going to happen next. Yeah. And I like that. I like that little bit of, you know, Hey, we're going to switch things around a little bit, make it a little bit more, you know, Difficult to predict, uh, even though generally it's it's not that far off. But the Madeline Pryor one is a good example of that. So, like, if you watched up to episode three, you know what they've changed. You know what's different about it. I mean, we didn't have a full Inferno. Uh, I don't think they could shove Inferno into uh, 22 minutes. But, um, you know, they alluded to it, um, but just presented it very differently. Uh, I also have to say that if some of these animators end up storyboarding action films, my God, 
these are some great action sequences yeah. in those first two episodes. Great action sequences. So are there any X-Men events that you guys would like to see them showcase that they haven't done before? If they could get away with it, no more mutants. Okay. And 198. Yeah. That would be really interesting to see how they would treat that. Um, I think they would surprise you with who they would select. Um, that I think, and it's funny because it's like, it's not even House of M. It's like the, it's like what happens after House, House of M. That's yeah. what I would like to see. I would like to see them do something with Whedon's Astonishing X-Men. Hmm. Like, I know they did. I know there was an Astonishing X-Men, like, there, it was its own thing, right? But I would like to see that done in this style and I, I really bring in, you know, the White Queen. Uh, I would like to see more of her. Okay. That, hmm. done like, that'd be fun. Uh, this is going to be kind of, like, weird and controversial, but I kind of want to see them do an ABX. Um, you know, really try to see what they can do or how they can kind of connect it together to the mm-hmm. greater Marvel universe, but also deal with, you know, the splitting of the Phoenix into five parts and what that does to these mutants who have to now, who now have the power, like a cosmic ability to destroy the world if they wanted to and how they use that. And I think that was, you know, it was fun to read. It was fun watching the fights, you know, and all in ABX and um, that whole series. But having, you know, Cyclops with the power of the Phoenix or Magic with the power of Phoenix or, you know, I think I, I think it'd just be really interesting to see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. To see how they would adapt it in something that would be, you know, one and done in 22 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Well, the other piece of news that we wanted to cover is something a bit more icky. Um, I don't know who wants to take us through it. <laughs> uh, You're not as qualified there, Caleb. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I can to a point. So um, I, earlier this week, I, I don't even remember what day it was at this point because it's been kind of a thing. Um, some some news started trickling out, right? You started seeing little things hit up on social media. Um a lot of it was, as you might expect, done on Twitter or X or whatever it's called these days. Um, the stuff that I saw tend to be on Blue Sky because that's really the only thing I get on other than Facebook and Instagram anymore. Um, but so apparently a kind of indie comics creator um, came out and said, hey, like, we need to really talk about some things. Uh, and Ed Pisker from... You know, uh, WYSIWYG fame, uh, hip hop family tree, X Men Grand Design, uh, comic or cartoonist kayfabe. Um, yeah, he's kind of a creep, and everybody was like, "What? Like, what? Are you, like, you know, what are you talking about?" And she was like, "Well, like, dude, like, he kept sliding into my DMs when I was seventeen. Like, wanted to know things, was using like weird, like, was saying, calling me like a dirty girl, and, like, and had screenshots of everything, and it is very." Um, very strange, but, you know, also offered to, you know, put her up in his spare bedroom should she come to uh, Pittsburgh and want to do stuff. And it was very suggestive. Inappropriate. There was no smoking gun, right? But it was very yeah. suggestive. It's um, inappropriate. Inappropriate. Yeah. And so what it boiled down to is, like, he's 40. He was sliding in my DMs. And it was very clear what he was looking for. Um, and it, I was a young, impressionable girl who wanted to break into comics and... This was another example of somebody using their, and again, according to Megan, was who was using their status and their, their platform to go out there and say, hey, if you want to break in, then you need to do things, right? We we saw something, we, we've seen this before. This was kind of the same thing that, um, now that I want to talk about it, I can't think of his name. Um, uh, Jason Aaron's partner on Southern Bastards, uh, Jason Latour. Jason Latour, uh, very very similar to what Jason Latour was accused. Local of. boy. Mm. Um, yeah. So, it, it, but but that started a trickle effect, right? Like once this hit the internet, other people started coming out, including somebody else who was like, "Yeah, no, he straight up told me if I wanted his editor's phone number, I had to suck him off." 
I was 18 or 19. And when that happened, according to the, to the person, right. So it just kind of became kind of a thing where it's like, Hey, this dude's almost 40 and he's looking for like barely legal folks to, to like slide into their DMS and maybe slide into other things caused a whole kerfluffle. Um, and to the point that like, at first I was just like, okay, what's going to happen with this? I mean, this is just a lot of internet noise. Right. And it was until it wasn't. And then all of a sudden the cartoonist kayfabe channel went down. And the cartoonist yeah. tape babe slack went down and all of their social media went away for a little bit. Um, and then reports started coming in from people who were on, who were patrons of that podcast and stuff who started saying, yeah, no, there's a lot of infighting right now. There's people at each other's throats. They're talking about getting rid of him. They're talking like, and of course I'm not in that group. So I have no idea the reality of that or not, but there was a lot of noise coming out of there saying, Hey, they're trying to distance themselves from him, but no one knows what's happening. Um, Though the the cartoonist kayfabe sites have since come back up, um, his his Ed Pisker's sites have not. Um, although there is reports of like a sock puppet account that he may or may not be operating, I have no idea. Not interested in knowing what's true, right? It's just weird drama. Yeah. All it boils down to, from my perspective, is no matter who you are, or number one, there are appropriate ways to talk to people. Number two, uh, no matter who you are, do not use your status and platform to offer people an opportunity at a career in exchange for sex. That is a no, no, do not do yeah. that. It is weird. Especially if you're in this weird power dynamic, male, uh, older guy, younger girl thing, it's not going to end well for you. And no. we, for better or worse, we live in the age of, and, and look, I, this is something that we've all talked about personally. Like uh, people want to throw around phrases like uh, cancel culture. I always respond to that. The cancel culture is not real. It's just consequence culture. And we live in a place of court of public opinion. No one's entitled to celebrity. That's always been my take on it. You may gain some garner, some favor and stuff like that, but no one's entitled to it. You can still go get a job at Burger King. It, it is what it is, right? That's, that's just the world we live in. If you get to a certain level, it, like bad things can happen. I hope it doesn't happen to any of us. Right. And hopefully no, there it shouldn't and there shouldn't be any receipts for this kind of thing but yeah. it just is what it is and it should not happen so we're yeah. gonna have to see we're gonna have to see what comes out of this um it you know i know ed pisker was supposed to have a very big um a, a very there was a local art studio or art space that was showing a showing showing his work uh and stuff that he that was really going to focus on him that's been canceled yeah, and they're they're in uh, in Pittsburgh, right? Like that's it's yeah. like so. And people also have to understand, like the art world in Pittsburgh post Andy Warhol is a, it's a major part of their culture. Yeah, it's a yeah. major part of that city's culture. Um, it's not like most other cities. I mean, you have people you never think would be going to galleries, go to galleries regularly in that region. Uh, so th that's a bigger deal than it would be in some other areas. Yeah. yeah. Well, and the other thing too that uh, that's kind of interesting with this. So this isn't the first time that Pisker's been, you know, courting drama or courting, you know, controversy. Uh, a lot of stuff that he did with Red Room, uh, and yeah. his, uh, you know, his writing partner, art partner, uh, cartoonist, KP partner, Jim Rugg worked on together. Um, you know, that has come up and and almost resulted in them getting, you know. All, canceled or consequenced really um but what's really interesting to me is that they are a major part of um the heroes con experience yeah. um they've been you know they've had sort of like the head table so to speak at the, the in the island section yeah they're, they're always center the, square they're the center square to use the hollywood squares yeah, they, they are yeah and they you know they have um you know they always have one of the most popular panels and you know, there's a lot of people that they've brought on that they've, you know, made big or at least introduced to a wider audience just by, you know, the nature of, of their exposure. So, you know, having Cartoonist Kayfabe as a platform feel this blowback in such a major way yeah. that they really haven't before is, uh, is, is pretty telling to me, I think, in that this is, it goes beyond just sort of like making light of the Holocaust on a very cover you know, or uh, being shocking about stuff that, uh, oh my gosh, I can't believe they drew that, or I can't believe that they were, are writing about that. 
like that's just you know some of its taste level some of its sort of you know uh, our consumer but this this kind of goes down to just you know the the way a, a person kind of comports themselves in an industry that has a history of this kind of um sort of gatekeeping through sex gatekeeping is but you know the older man and the younger artist, or at least especially in this case, the younger female artist or writer, you know, it's, it's, it's just creepy and icky. And I think a lot of people kind of feel that and understand that they're not, you know, I think it's less easy to defend that. Yeah. It seems with this one, there's, there's fewer, there's fewer knee jerk reactions. Yeah. uh, Than some other controversies have generated. Well, and, I mean, Steve, Steve, you hit on the kind of controversy that came out of, you know, Red Room and, and some of the other stuff that, that they've done. Yeah. I want to make it clear, like, I've got, you know, I, one of the, there, there's a lot of stuff about this, that this whole scenario that frustrates me, right? Every time this happens, you always hear people go all of a sudden, oh, it was known. It's a it's a loud secret in the group. Number yeah. one, number one, no. No, no, fuck off with that, right? Like, <laughs> if, if you if you know about something like this and you're staying quiet about it, then 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 go away. Like, you're you're part of the problem, right? I hate this idea that oh well, it was a quiet secret. Then say something. Yeah. Say why, why did you did you seriously why keep it a secret? Yeah, <laughs> if, if this isn't 1964. It, say something, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> why are you waiting, right? If you knew about it, blow the whistle, right? I I hate that because it's always people are like, well, I was in on something that nobody else was, right? Okay, so you're just then you're being listen, baby. Yeah, I was gonna say, a, you're complicit, <laughs> and b, you're being a drama vulture. That's it, right? You're being a drama. A, no, you didn't. You didn't know. You're not part of the in crowd, Mister. I like listen to popcorn on the internet. Like it just, you're not. So stop, right? We're talking about real lives, and, and that's the yeah. thing that bugs me the most. But it, it, that's just what it is. I can separate real life from art, right? I actually really, really, really like subversive art. Um, some of my favorite books were subversive at the time, right? Stuck Rubber Baby, right? That was a subversive yeah. book that when it was put out, when it was made, was taboo, right? Like it, 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 you know, it was just a thing you didn't see, right? Subversive is one thing. Even if you want to be distasteful, Right. That's fine. It's art like be taste like the First Amendment is a real thing. Be distasteful, be subversive to a point that we can like or dislike on its merits because it's art. Absolutely. This is real life. If you are you are using your position to keep somebody out of a career or to promise them things in operation for sex, that is abuse. This is real. These are separate things. Right. I can dislike Ed Pisker and I do. For lots of reasons, including the fact that once he got his little platform on cartoonist Kafluffer or whatever it's called, he decided to call a shit ton of my friends who take work for the big two jobbers and opportunists and sellouts and everything else for taking jobs to put money on the table. Meanwhile, this motherfucker's biggest paycheck comes from Marvel. Yeah. Yeah. I can dislike him for that because that's just him being a douchebag. Right. Wholly separate. So like that's one of the things that I cannot stand is like. We, we when people see this stuff and they want to weigh in as if they were in the know when they weren't right or when they say I always knew or they can look at art and say and that's the thing right like yes it's it's weird and creepy but the, we have to be able to separate it you can make disturbing art you can make Hannibal Lecter without being a serial killer cannibal you can make Red Room without like diving into that right like the, you cannot go look at everybody who makes subversive art as if oh they're really bad people in real life should not be doing that. But if you're a real person in real life and you're doing these bad things, no, no, no remorse, no time for you whatsoever. Right. Just, yeah. If you see something, say something. I mean, it really is that simple. Yeah. And it's, I think that's, I think that is, you know, kind of at the heart of it too. If, you know, if people know about it and they kept quiet, then, you know, they, then they support that kind of behavior. Um, and, you know, there was, there was some, you know, initial grumbling about like, well, why did they wait so long? You know, did they wait until they had a little bit more success or whatever before they came out and talked about it? Like, that doesn't matter. That that really doesn't matter. Timing doesn't really matter when it comes to, ex- you know, exposing abuse for what it is. Unless you knew about it earlier and you were not the person, like, <laughs> you may not have been the person doing it, but you knew about it 
and you didn't say anything, you're essentially saying that you support that behavior yeah. and that you appreciate that behavior. Um, it, it doesn't matter how good of an artist or writer you are. If you do things like, you know, you mentioned Jason Latour. I mean, co-creator of spider Gwen. Um, you know, Southern Bastards, one of my favorite books of all time. Yep. Um, massively talented. Ed Pisker's massively talented. Massively oh, yeah. talented. Yeah. Doesn't say anything about like their ability to spin a tail or, you know, draw something that draws you in. It it does say something about their own personal character if they are terrible people. And they get called out on it. And it's like it's not anybody else's fault that they got called out. It is their own fault that they got called out. Um, because they shouldn't have done it. And Ed should not have been creepy. I actually if he was and a lot has been made about like, you know, the age difference. If he was twenty two and doing this to a seventeen year old, it still would be gross. Because he's using his position of power, he's using his, you know, his platform or like his the the fact that he's representing a bigger platform and has the exposure and uh, you know, is a known person. You know, you can't you can't do that. Well, look, and if at the end of the day, if you're if you're into younger folks, you're into younger like that, like so. I, I don't want to. I don't want to also make it sound like like oh, if you're of a certain age, you can't. Like, if you want to get on yeah. grinder or whatever and find a twink, a nineteen year old, and bang it out, like go do you, right? That's not the problem. The problem is the gatekeeping, right? The problem is yeah. the is the quid pro quo. If you yeah. do these things, I might introduce you to the right people. Like that's not. It's, that's it's just gross. That gets me. That's gross. But also, they, they also even if the, like, I'll introduce you to the right people if you do these things, but also, you know, the hitting on underage people and, like, being really gross. The, the whole, like, naughty girl, dirty girl kind of talk yeah, was the, a little... Yeah, this isn't Lolita. Lolita is not a, uh, is, is not a blueprint for how you should live your life. It is, but uh, not, not really an indefensive kind of situation. But I will say in the text messages and stuff that the receipts that were put online and everything, mm -hmm. he did say, are you 17 or 18? Like, again, probably shouldn't be in a situation to ask that question. But to his defense, like, he did say, wait, are you 17 or 18? Oh, shit, you're 17? God damn it. Like, eh. like you know, so like, you know. Uh, and, and that's, also, also, that's also a little like, don't even say it. Don't even get to that point. You have to start an argument to rebut yourself with, well, the age of consent law is, yeah, you're, you're, you're not going to, it's not going to work out well. You've already lost the war. Like you're just, you know, but it's just, it's un, it aggravates me. And I will say the, to no end, it, at least in this time, I did not see a lot of people rushing to do the white knight defense or anything mm -hmm. like that. So yeah. I, I will say maybe, maybe we're just past that point. So yeah. I, I hope I'm not going to wish ill will on anybody. Right. Like I, I don't, I don't know the truth. I'm not a finder. Of, as I tell people in my day job all the time, I'm not a judge. I'm not a finder of fact. I'm here to advise, but that's it. Right. But I wish the best for everybody. Hopefully this works out in the best way possible. And there are no more victims or whatever. I really feel bad for Jim Rugg and Tom Scioli because at least, or, they have done nothing wrong that we know of. I don't that we know, know of that. That's yeah. that's, and I want to caveat. There's, there's that. a gray area there. Yeah, we don't know what they knew. Um, we don't know what they didn't know, know right? But but they the only I think is, is there's a, there's enough. Yeah. Distance, but yeah. Rug, I think it's you know if if they've been in each other's pockets for that long, they're yeah. It, it, we don't know. Yeah. All right. Enough ick. On to yeah. happier thoughts. On to, on to happier things, like the, well. <laughs> the emotional trauma that always is the X-Men. All right, so Steve, uh, you have a, actually a, like a cluster of books you want to talk about. So why don't we start off with you? It's funny that you should say the word cluster. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to be talking about the one-two punch miniseries that is essentially wrapping up the Krakoan era X-Men. And that is Rise of the Powers of X. I have to get this. I have to read it to get it right. Rise of Powers of X or Powers of Ten uh, and Fall of the House of X. So Rise of and Fall of, or as I have put very nicely right down there, Ropox and Fohox um, is basically the, you know, the wrap up, the final two miniseries that are wrapping up the Grakoan saga. And let me see if I can put them up here. I am going to actually start with uh, the one that takes place 10 years or ish 
in the future, and that is Rise of the Powers of X. Um, so both of these books do take place in different years. So Rise uh, takes place about 10 years into the future, um, sort of like the Krakoa plus 10 era that we were sort of vaguely introduced into a possible version of way back in the days of Fox Fox. Um, and in this one, it's looking pretty bleak, uh, not just for the mutants of Earth, but for Earth as a whole. Earth has just been absolutely decimated by the war between Orcus, well, Nimrod and, uh, you know, uh, the Omega Sentinel, and all the remaining mutants on Earth. Um, and it's it's pretty devastating. Um, there are humans that are still around, but even then, you know, a lot of them are, are basically just pawns of Orcus at this point. Um, you know, just uh, turning in other humans or fighting alongside of them, just use as cannon fodder, more or less. Um, and there are very few mutants left. Um, the mutants that are fighting on the side of uh, Professor X, um, you know, are essentially you have Professor himself, um, you've got Cypher, uh, and you've got Rachel, uh, formerly known as the other Phoenix, Rachel Summers. Um, the three of them, along with Rasputin the Fourth, are kind of holding for in this weird space outside of time, the no space. Um, and the, uh, you know, the people who are kind of the foot soldiers who are fighting, trying to, you know, get something done. We've got uh, Captain Krakoa, a.k.a. Miss Marvel. You've got what is Shadow Cat now after uh, ingesting a legacy virus and becoming sort of like this super, you know, uh, mutant thing. Uh, you've still got Wolverine because, of course, you, you can't ever have you know, a book without Wolverine, even if it's in the far future. Um, you've also got uh, uh, Sync, as well as the ghost of Tony Stark, Iron Man. Um, it's basically an AI version of Tony Stark before he was murdered that inhibits uh, or inhabits uh, the suit that he built, uh, the sort of like a nano. Quick suit. question. Who's, who's in the Blue Beetle costume there? <laughs> the Blue Beetle costume? That is Iron Man. Well, that's, AI Tony Stark. That's the ghost of Tony Stark. As yeah. The ghost of Tony Stark. Yeah. So, you know, everybody. Oh, okay. I, I, to... see, I see Iron Man now, not Blue Beetle. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's Iron Man ish, uh, you know. Okay. Um, yeah. But uh, but Kieran Gillen's writing this, and uh, you know it, it's it's very bleak. There's a lot of like really awesome action, some beautiful beautiful uh, you know artwork um, in this by uh, uh, Silva. I forgot his first name. Um, but you've also got a lot of work with uh, Rasputin the Fourth. So you know they're fighting for their lives more or less, uh, a losing battle. And one of the things um, that we find out uh, with Nimrod here is sort of leading the charge along with the Mega Sentinel um, against the remainders of the X-Men here, um, is that really the whole purpose is to bring about a dominion. Um, you know, they are looking to bring in sort of an extra uh, universal force that's going to recognize their ascendancy and they will, you know, ascend to this next plane of existence. Something, again, that was referred to way back in Hawks Pax, back in the day of sort of like, you know, how humanity then evolved, you know, into, you know, godlike beings, but then beyond galaxies, something beyond the universe. Um, and that's their, that's kind of their whole ploy. They're going to destroy all the X-Men. They've completely decimated all of humanity uh, just by being there. So what's remaining of Orcus, which is Nimrod and, uh, you know, and Omega Sentinel um, are going to be turning this on. Now, there is one other person as well, and that is Dr. Stasis, one of the many clones of uh, good old Mr. Sinister, um, whose idea it was to sort of bring in the Dominion um, earlier, like a thousand years earlier than it should have happened. Um, and it turns out that this is something that has been tried many, many times before, of course, by all the other Sinister clones in several of the other books that we've seen. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, it's already happened. Sinister has already become a Dominion. We knew this if you were reading uh, some of the other books recently, the, the uh, Sins of Sinister, 
uh, that I talked about earlier last year. Um, it's become clear that a sinister has ascended to become a Dominion. Just that sinister itself. And interestingly enough, has been doing its hardest to stop any other sinister from becoming a Dominion too, including the plans of this sort of like weird, you know, Orcus Nimrod sort of centered uh, reality. And, um, you know, no matter how hard the X-Men are fighting here, it is a losing battle. They are going to lose. There's nothing that they can do. Um, it's all going to go to crap. Everybody's going to die. And, uh, you know, there's going to be Dominion form. Except for the fact that it's already been formed. They've already kind of lost, but then so has Dr. Stasis and Nimrod and everybody else. Because somebody else has already beat them there. So, in order to save everything professor x cypher and rachel um and rasputin sort of work on a plan together to find a way to go back in time to moira mcteckard for right before she uh first realizes her ability as a mutant to reset the universe and that's kind of where they leave things off um in uh rise three now or sorry fall three uh oh my gosh i i totally i i'm already going into fall so it is kind of confusing but they're all working about this in the future in the past and we're going to go bring this up now fall of the house effects <laughs> um things are really dire for the x-men uh we've got uh cyclops who is basically um up uh, you know, doing a trial of Magneto. Uh, he's going to be on trial for, you know, uh, for basically representing all the mutants. Um, and, uh, you know, he's in prison, essentially being held uh, to be put up for trial. We've got, um, you've got Colossus and Wolverine trying to break him out. You've got, uh, you know, the White Queen kind of doing her thing um, underground, trying to, you know, keep all the pieces on the board and, and free Cyclops as well. Um, but in prison, Dr. Gregor of the Orcus Foundation meets with Cyclops because she has realized something very interesting about her organization. She doesn't trust it anymore. She knows that Nimrod, who is, you know, based on the, the brain scan of her husband, um, is, uh, and also Omega Sentinel has a very separate plan, uh, for everything. Um, and it's, it's very interesting. She actually helps, uh, you know, get Cyclops out of prison along with magic. Um, we also have the good old daughter of Magneto, Polaris, who brings with her, uh, the, uh, well-known, um, home of the Guardians of the Galaxy, um, the, you know, dead head of a celestial, uh, to the battle with Orcus in orbit. Um, and it's just, it's absolutely crazy and shocking. You've also got Dr. Stasis around as well. You've got all sorts of things that are happening here. Um, lots of great action. I'm trying to compress this a lot because there's just so much going on. Um, lots of really cool action in space. You've got two swords that are crossed. You've got all these things that are happening. And of course, this is tying in with what's happening in Rise as well. Um, back and forth with, you know, the plans to go back in time and make sure that uh, Moira never really resets the universe or resets it in the same way. And with all of these things going on, uh, the newest issue of Fall just released yesterday. Um, there is a very shocking death. And I'm not going to show what that is. I'm not going to spoil that for anybody. Um, but it's all kind of, it's going a little crazy. <laughs> Um, and I, I love it. I love how over the top this is. I love how, uh, you know, Kieran Gillen and, uh, um, and Dugan are, are really kind of playing with all of these, of all these characters together, throwing the most horrible things at them. Um, tons of action, just really, really cool. But it's, of course, just doing the usual apocalyptic, uh, X-Men story where everything's going to get really horrible. Everything's going to go horribly wrong, and then somehow something will fix it. And 
I do love the craziness of it. I do love reading these back to back. I think that there's, you know, there's so much going on here. But, um, you know, we are getting points where uh, I think even diehard fans are going to say, okay, just end it. <laughs> just, just end it. We want to see the universe implode. We want to see the timeline just fold in on itself. What are we going to do? You know, how is this going to end? How can we get back to a new status quo and reset everything post Krakoa? Um, we've got only a couple months left in, when all the books, you know, line wide are going to end. Um, so, but I, I am going to be continuing to follow this. It is just wild. I wish Brian were here so he could talk about it um, because I know this is, you know, this X Men insanity is bread and butter for him. But um, I, I'm enjoying it. I love these action scenes that they're putting in here. I love the characters that they've gone with as sort of like the, you know, the final bulwark for humanity as well as for mutant Um But, uh, but yeah, uh, if you have not been reading X-Men up to this point or any of the X-Books or have any idea what's been going on, you'll be so lost. Um, but I do have to give them credit for pulling so much back to Hoxpox to House of X and Powers of Ten, you know, what started this whole thing, they do refer to that a lot. They do give a lot of credence to um, Hickman's original design for this, um, almost forgetting the past, like, three years of uh, of Krakoan storytelling just to kind of get back to that point. Um, and I do appreciate that. But, uh, but yeah, I think, it, is anybody, like, are you guys reading this at all? Um, I'm woefully behind. I've got, a, I've got them. I just, they're stacked up. Um, uh, the last X Men book I read was Inferno. Oh, okay. The um, the the uh, the new Inferno, the the, the, Inferno. the, the Hickman Inferno. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I do have to say, oh, I love these covers. Course, I, I, nah, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. I love these. I love these covers. I I love the work that's been done. I think it's um, I want to say that the person who's been doing most of the covers. Uh, Pepe Larraz and Marta Garcia. Pepe Larraz is a beast. I mean, just this is a beautiful, beautiful image. I just I love these. And colors. I like oh. this one too, like Dr. Stasis with Wolverine's claw right on it. And you know, not to say it's like, oh, that never happened in the book, but you know, close enough. Um, really, uh, really fun stuff. I'm just well, you were you were showing the interiors, and one thing I do want to like. I love Pepe Larage, right? That that mm -hmm. dude set the mold for this this era of the mutants. He really did, um, and they've done a really good job pulling in artists who fit in that in, into what Pepe Larage looks like, right? The, people of the yeah. same school. Very few people. I mean, no one's going to be him, right? Like, and very few people mm -hmm. can come close. But they are pulling in some artists. And I think Silva is one of them that are you know, they're similar. It, it, oh it yeah, yeah. Silva, I think you know. Just, just the layouts alone, um, you know, just, just the way that he presents a lot of this stuff is just, it's just, it's gorgeous. And you know, everything seems to be I, like this is a, this is definitely a title where they threw a lot of talent at. I mean, Gillen and Duggan, you know, as yeah. like telling these twin stories, they're not even bookend stories; they're interwoven completely, yeah. um, even though they take place in different timelines. But it's just. Um, it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot to read in what's ultimately going to be, I think, probably about 10 issues worth of uh, of story. Um, it's also kind of pricey. The first issues for both of them uh, come in at $5.99, and then the rest of the issues are $4.99. I would say it, it's worth it because they are longer. They, they do have more page, page, uh, more page count here. Um, but, yeah, it's kind of like a, uh, I guess this is going to be the path forward. Once it gets rebooted, I think everything's going to be $4.99 at least. That's what I've been seeing more and more. So, mm -hmm. uh, it's a lot. Thank you, Steve. Oh, <laughs> Caleb, who has two independent books, I do. Um, so, I, I will. I will start with the one from our friends over at Fantagraphics. Uh, and to start with that, I have a couple of questions. Um, I, I assume you both, you know. Or at least know of uh, John Coltrane's A Love Supreme. Mm -hmm. You know, oh. most, most people, I think, even if you're in super jazz, um, 
hang on. Okay, I'm Ooh, back. A little internet stutter. There we go. We can hear you. We're waiting for you, baby. <laughs> All right, I'm. I should uh, be back know. now. Cool. There we go. All right. Yeah, I like that it waits till I start talking to start doing anything. It's been fine the whole time. Anyway, fucking gremlins. Um, so I, I assume both of you are familiar with John Coltrane's "A Love Supreme," right? Mm -hmm. Like, we, you know, most people, even if you're not into jazz, resolution pursuing yeah. song. I know. It. But are are you familiar with the philosophy yeah. of a love supreme? Yes. Okay. But I'm not so like that, other people. Yeah. Right. Right. So so yeah. a lot of people may not know like they've they've heard John Coltrane's "A Love Supreme," but they may not understand the philosophy behind that, which really is what jo John Coltrane was trying to do was to take and essentially tell an egg, kind of an existentialist, but also universalist story about spirituality based on the like African-American history and the black experience in the United States or what would become the United States throughout the whole thing. Right. There's there's a whole built in idea behind the um, uh, behind that. Right. This this religion and the black experience. So the reason I bring that up. Right. Is because. In order to to really, I think, truly appreciate the book that I'm going to talk about now, go listen to John Coltrane's Love Supreme. Take like an hour of your life and just Google the philosophy of Love Supreme. Catch yourself up on it because you need that background to really, really understand this new book from uh, Fantagraphics, which is called The N-Word of God by Mark Dukes, written and uh, written and drawn by Mark Dukes. Um this book is hard to talk about for a couple different reasons, right? And and just the, the very obvious reason is because I'm very white, um, like, which makes it like obviously like there's a lot that goes into this that is like I, I I'm just I can only recount it, right? I can only take somebody's word for it, right? Um, Mark Dukes is a very interesting individual. Um, at some point in his life, he decided to. Um, to become an Eastern Orthodox monk at a monastery in Texas. And Mark Dukes is a black man. He, he, he's a black American man, right? When you think about Eastern Orthodox Christianity, you don't typically think about black men. You don't really typically think about Texans. I, but, you know, so somewhere on that line, there's a monastery in Texas that's an Eastern Orthodox church. And he becomes a monk there. Um, and he lives as a monk there for a little bit. And then he realizes, hey, this is, this is not for me. Um, this does not... Uh, this is not adding up to what I want. So he he leaves and he moves to San Francisco and he joins a church um, that is basically the that their patron saint is John Coltrane. And all of that history of his life culminates into him him really trying to figure out how to contextualize being black in America and the religious experience. Um, and so what he does with the N word of God is he rewrites uh christian history like he 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 almost um he he adopts it he adapts it and he appropriates it right and so what he delivers in this book is a a history of how god made the world and it starts it's basically a conversation between himself or the narrator and largely this figure called saint sambo so he goes through this whole thing where he talks about just kind of this, the initial version, the, like the initial culmination of, of Genesis, where God separated the light and dark, right? This first time that you really take color or race or identity, right? And you separate them and light is deemed as positive in the first books of Genesis and dark is deemed as negative. And he goes from there, this conversation with St. Sambo about how, look, this, this was... This was set up to have a whole universe that righteousness equals righteousness, you know, and he delivers this story, which is just like I said, it's it's just this exposition. It's a conversation of how we got to where we are now, largely using Christian iconography. Um, and he goes into the different elements of culture. He goes into the, you know, how, you know, the the slave trade brought Africans to America and then they were given Christianity and how that morphed. And now you have a very strong Christian movement in the United States, but it's based off of, in, at least in his opinion, you know, and, and I, this is opinion I would agree with. Right. But the it's based off of a very um, 
white supremacist ideology. And he plays with that. He says, what does this say? So how does this tie into to modern iconography? Um, and what what he is, as you can see from the pictures that we're showing, what he ends up with is this very iconoclastic piece of um, piece of literature with these absolutely stunning uh, and just truly gorgeous recreations of 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 Eastern Christian iconography that show black people um, in there. And there's a lot of subversive messaging in this. But the whole book really just again, it's hard to talk about what it is because it's largely a conversation. He is trying to figure out what to do from a very um, academic perspective, what to do with blackness, what to do with religion, what to do with the way that he feels about it, with his own personal history, with the history of the world, with the history and the development of, of black religion in America. Um, and he's trying to figure out how to contextualize it. And and ultimately, I don't know that he really ends on an, an, on an answer, he uses kind of, um, you know, he uses imagery of blackface. He uses uh, he uses uh, things like Aunt Jemima, right? He, he uses Sambo. Um, he, he obviously uses John Coltrane in here. He uses these figures that are put out and post out, uh, you know, sent out into the world as kind of this just de depictions of blackness in some form or another um, in our everyday modern life. And he asks us to see what these things do how they work, um, how, how you, how you are. And it, this image is actually very, very well timely put Steve, because uh, largely what he's saying is in a world in America where racism is a thing, right. But it, where, where both white people and black people, the predominant religion is Christianity. Why we still have this gulf in between them and why we still have racism that exists in, in, in a religion are largely predominated on the, the sense of love your neighbor as yourself. Um, and again, I, you know, I'm not going to speak as, you know, I can't speak of this from personal experience. I, I read the book. I love the book. The book is very subversive. There are things in there that, you know, make me scratch my head. I don't know. Uh, there, there are things in there that I think are, are really interesting, right? I, I would love to know more. I would love to have a conversation with, with Mr. Dukes. Um, but by and large, the, the way that the book is delivered the artwork, it, it's, it's a very postmodern book, right? So it's, it's, you have words over here and you have pictures over here. It's not, it's not a comic in the sense that we think about them. It's not, they, they are juxtaposed, but there's not panels. Um, he just shows you these large pieces of work um, that, that are meant to give you an idea and really play off stereotypes um, to make you think. And, and I like books, whether I agree with them or not, right? I like books that make me think. And so I was really happy to see this, really happy to read it. Um, I love books that, that you know, again, tap into history, that tap into culture, that tap into philosophy. I, I think they're fun. I think they're interesting. And I think that they they are a big part of the texture of, of literary comics. So I would I, like I would love to know what other people who have read this think about it, good, bad or otherwise. But for me, it's it's a very strong work. Right. I, I don't have to. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be a universal truth to be a strong work for me. I thought it was just a very, very an incredible accomplishment if it exists at all. Um, and again, it just it made me think and it upended a lot of the way that I, I've, I've viewed some of the things in the world. Um, so I, I, I really think it's something worthwhile. I'm glad Fantagraphics uh, was able to publish this. Um, and, you know, where we just spent some time talking about another artist who was, you know, is considered a subversive artist to some degree and um, has a big platform and, and didn't really do a whole lot with it uh, other than what he did with it. Uh, this is interesting to me and I'd like to see more of this. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I, I like um, how he's how he's sort of creating these images. Um, it, it's really interesting that he, of course, was an Orthodox monk because this very much Orthodox art. Yeah. It's, it, this is Orthodox That's, iconography. That was my comment. That was the comment. But it's like iconoclastic iconography. So it's well, like, yes. it, 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 in a way, it's breaking itself to create something new. And I, I, I just, I love the art. I love well, the art. That's that's one it's of like, the things. It makes me feel uncomfortable in certain, like some some of the imagery, of course, is discomforting because you know it's. Um, it, you know, it plays on a, a stereotypical image or, you know, certain things that 
uh, you know, get thrown in where, you know, you, you know that they're, they have a history of sort of like, uh, you know, racist imagery, yeah. but it's being repurposed in this really interesting way. And, you know, with sort of a very, in a very religious medium. And I, I, I think that's really, it's really unique. And I'm, I'm curious to, I don't know if I can pick this up most places because I'm sure most places wouldn't normally carry it because of the fact that it's so controversial. Yeah. Um, what is the but, price uh, point on this, Caleb? So according to the back of the book, it's twenty nine ninety nine. But it's it's a it's a it's a thick book. It's a hardcover. Yeah. Um, it's very well it's very well done. I mean, look, I mean, just the like yeah. Mm-hmm. It this is. I mean, like I just I, I opened a page I can actually show on, and there's some there's some pages that I'm not going to show on here, right? Like, um, <laughs> but it, uh, Steve, like you are absolutely right when you you point out the fact, and and, and Bill, you were saying this too. Like, I saw when I, when I started researching this book because I really wanted to figure out how to talk about it. I really wanted to figure out how I could contextualize it to, for a book that's trying to contextualize another thing. And I got online and I saw an individual for who was making a very, you know, some good points. But he said, hey, look, at the end of like one thing we need to talk about is this is cultural appropriation. And and I, th- I found it interesting that he made that comment on the back of the book. It says it flat out says on, on the back of the book, he is appropriating these things to prove a point. But the, the minute I saw that, I was like, yes and no. This book is iconoclastic. That's the difference. Um, and and to the point that it does make you uncomfortable, it reminds me of of like Lovecraft Country, right? Where you get the the little mm. dancing girls in that scene, and it's doing something different. It's it should yeah, make you uncomfortable, right? Like this is an th- th- this is not comfort food. This is art that makes you uncomfortable um, to certain degrees, and, and I think it makes everyone uncomfortable. I mean, I read an interview where he's talking about. It, he's like, no, no, this stuff makes me uncomfortable. Yeah. To, to produce something that make that that is disturbing yourself, to produce something that that inherently asks you, who am I as a human, and and to make people feel uneasy, right? That's not a that's not a not an easy thing to do, um, and to produce a piece of work that is uh, three hundred and sixty six pages long of that, that tells a very cohesive story and ends ends an amazing conversation um I, it's a book i'm not gonna forget well yeah <laughs> the, the other question i have is that you mentioned the the pretty high page count but also taking into consideration the structure of the book how how long a read was that it took me so I read it in two days in two different chunks, right? And and okay. when we talk about so you have some books that are or some pages, you know, this is the text on. Yeah, you, know, you can read yeah. those pretty quick, but I just didn't have an idea of what. I mean, a lot of the majority. I'm sorry about the lighting. Um, the majority of the pages are like that, right? Like <laughs> it's a chunk of text, so you're getting you're getting full robust reading. Like if you broke down just the text alone, there's probably, probably a hundred, 110 pages of full text to this. So uh, it's a lot. And sometimes again, it's a literal conversation that he's having with these figures with, with St. Sambo. Sometimes it's a literal conversation that he's having with God. Um, And then sometimes he's just laying out a narrative of the history of the universe and how these things were made. Um, And he, he really does it. One of the things that I haven't really spoke about, and I can't spend too much time on it, but the way that he plays with language is is very interesting. Like, again, the, one of the biggest keys is righteousness and righteousness. Right. He plays with language in a very interesting way to show you the overlap and how these things affect history, uh, which I thought was kind of fascinating for, from from somebody who you know took linguistic classes and, and is, has, a, has an interest in those things because I'm a nerd. Yeah, I do think if you listen to the show instead of watch, you're at a tremendous disadvantage right now with this segment because it's it would be very hard to uh, provide adequate descriptions of. Go to Google. Go like go to Google and look look at what's offered there. Like, yeah, cool. And what's the other book? Oh, it's I forgot. I'm I'm the Caleb sandwich. Um, <laughs> 
Um, so the other book actually comes from our friends over at Boom Studios, and it is rare. It's again, it's a it's it's another book. I'm I'm apparently into culture tonight. Um, rare flavors is written by somebody who is quickly becoming one of my favorite writers in comics right now, Ram V, with Felipe Andrade on the art. And oh my God, when I say Felipe Andrade is doing work with this art, it is it is stunning. Right there, there is just something about this that uh it is some next level stuff it's that kind of I, yeah for those of you who are looking he, he's got a very thin line he's not photorealistic it, it's almost he's taking portions of cartooning and making it look a little bit like woodblock uh art uh and just giving you some whole different levels of texture uh I, it's it's almost got like a little bit of James Stokoe, but not a bunch of James Stokoe in the way that he does his lines and everything. It's just, it, it, he's got a fascinating style. Um, but the book largely is, um, it is, you know, I, I guess if I had to give the elevator elevator pitch for it, what happens when a Indian eternal demon um, really falls in love with food and culture? Uh, when, when an Indian cannibalistic demon falls in love with food and culture and wants to um, wants to really experience that and and create something that will last and stand the test of time. Uh, and so that's what you have here. Um, this demon is a type of demon called a Rashaka. I, I, I'm probably mispronouncing that. Uh, and he's he is, at least to the degree that we understand it, he's immortal, right? He's been around for a very, very, very long time. Uh, and he's also a cannibalistic demon, but, you know, and that's, that's bearing the lead a little bit. You don't find that out till at the end of the first uh, series, really. Right. But he, um, he falls in love with flavor, right? He falls in love with, uh, yeah, he, he's watched Stephen Bourdain too many times. If that's such a thing, you, by the way, you can't right? Stephen Bourdain is, is a fascinating person. Um, is just, I, I could, Anthony, Anthony, Bourdain. Anthony, sorry, Anthony. my brain. Anthony. Anthony Bourdain, yeah. Anthony, Anthony. Anthony Bourdain, he's what he, he's he's delved into that psychology, right? And so, what he wants to do is create something that really celebrates that, but in the way that that only he can. So he goes and he finds a a young man, a, a struggling filmmaker who's kind of given up on life, and he says, "Look." I want to pay you. I want to create a documentary. And, and what we're going to do is we're going to go around India, right? We're going to we're going to do the Anthony Bourdain thing where we we travel around and we find out how things are really made. Like we're going to go find the field where the spices are grown. We're going to tell you the history of them. We're going to find the people who harvest those things. Right. We're going to find everything that makes our culture and our food something unique and special. And we're going to talk about the spirit of it. And we're going to talk about these rare flavors. Right. Um and they do that uh, much to um, the young cinematographer's chagrin at first. It, you know, he's kind of hesitant. He's like, yeah, but I don't want to. I've already hung up my camera. Um, don't want to get into that. But he's, you know, with with money and time, he coaxes him into doing it and, and really touches on the, the artistic side of him. So they go on this adventure. Again, the, the young man does not realize that the Rishaka is a cannibal. And so part of what they're doing is they go all around and they find these these places and people, um, you know, he will go off and then come back with a meal uh, of some expertly, exquisitely cooked food. It's a human, right? It, it, it is taking all of the the spices and the flavors and the, 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 the processes of cooking these foods. And he's doing it with human flesh and making something beautiful out of murder, um, you know, to some degree. Uh, meanwhile, in the background of all of this, he's not the only immortal, right? He's not the only person who knows about this and he's being hunted. Um, there are, there are people whose legacies are tracking him down and trying to get rid of him. And for the most part, he has stayed off the radar for a couple hundred years. So everyone no knew where he was, but now he's reemerged, so to speak. And, and he's making waves and noise and these hunters are going to find him. Um, I love food. Like I, for, I, I love the culinary experience. Like the last time I was in Chicago, right? I met up with our friend Arnie, and we went and spent way too much money on a three Michelin star meal. 
right? Because of the experience, because of what was in it. And just because, I, you know, to say we can't, right? I love food. I, I love... I love Anthony Bourdain. I, I like the experience of travel. I like the culture. I like seeing other worlds. I like knowing how the sauce is made, so to speak. And I know how, I like knowing how the history of the sauce. I like knowing how the love goes into it. I like knowing how certain spices made their way from Portugal and were were cultivated and loved in in arid climates that they were not naturally supposed to be in, and what that did for it. Right. I also like mythology and I like history and I like the the weird almost political machinations that are written into Ram V's stories. Um and, and it's not really fair to say political. I bet that may not even be the right word, but right, he's he's like telling you how almost geopolitically how how these things work um or or how they should be viewed or at least how in his opinion they should be viewed. And he's doing that here with gorgeous art and a gorgeous premise and a fun premise. And he's taking you on a wild ride. Uh, and I can't recommend it enough. This is already on the short list for one of my favorite books this year. And and they actually they do the thing, right? They tell you how certain how to make certain dishes. There, there's recipes in this, right? They, there's there's things that go into how you should prepare these meals. So fun book. Glad Boom is publishing it. Uh, cannot wait to read more. Um you know, also he's kind of a bearish dude with a mustache that smokes a lot of cigars, and that's a thing. So it's not not it's not not bad either. I could deal without the murder teeth, but that's just a person. <laughs> well, you know, murder teeth. So I, um, this looks to me is this a? I don't want to say continuation or sequel, but does it um, tie in at all with Ramvi's uh, last book that I think he did with with him, um, the Star. Many Lives of Lila Starr? Yeah, I I don't think so. They could, I, but I don't I don't think they do. But he in both books he kind of plays into kind of the proto Indian mythologies, right? So I yeah. mean there, there there is a shared kind of thing, which he did the same thing in Swamp Thing too. So right. you know and and uh, but I mean, I can see them tying them together, but I, I think this kind of stands alone and it, it just it is singular in and of itself, but. You know, he's he's writing what he knows uh, to some degree. Uh, you know, he, he was born in, and raised in Mumbai. So this is part of his world that he's bringing now to 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 a Western audience. So um, there's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of crossover and a lot of things that seem to to overlap in his stories. Uh, my question is, and this is from well, we got a comment. So, Steve, why don't you oh, yeah. Uh, D- Daniel Williamson says, I read the first couple issues, but I suspect it probably works better as a trade. Kind of like a European comic book. I, maybe. yeah, I can see, I can see that. Um, I've only, I, so I only have the first three issues. So I, I've read up to the first three issues. I, so I can't speak to whether it would work better as a trade, right? Um, Ram V is a writer that sometimes I think his stuff works better in trade. Layla Star, I think, works better in a trade form, right? Yeah. Um, and that was what I read all in floppies. Yeah, sw- Swamp Thing. I can read issue to issue. This I'm reading issue to issue. I think it, it it may it really I think this one it really does it could go either way it just depends on what mood you're in. Yeah. Um. Did did the uh, Felipe Andrade do the cover? As far as I know, yes. It, it okay, looks so like him. Uh, let me. Boom is usually really good about um presentation about cover. What the hell was that? I did a demon. We we the, we 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 got a demon. Um, okay. Um, anyway, Steve, if you can just put that up, and uh, you know, this is just the world that I come out of. Um, to me, this is very reminiscent of the work of James McMullen, who was the principal yeah. artist for Lincoln Center Theater. Um, I just sent you guys a bunch of uh, images on our thread, and that was the first thing that came to mind. Um, so I was just wondering, you know, apart from the elements that you uh, presented in your conversation there, Caleb, was there a theatrical element to this as well? Uh, well, to, to a degree. And by the way, yes, uh, Philip Andrade did did the covers. OK, great. The, the, to, to a degree. Right. Because you one of your main characters is a is a filmmaker. So they, they do show, I mean, and in showing different places, they show some, some elements of theater, um, okay. but, but not, not to, not overtly. No. Yeah. 
Um, most of most and, of and I mean story, about that in structure, not necessarily about um. Uh, it, yeah. In structure, yeah, in, in structure, it would not be hard to adapt this into a play. The hardest part to adapt this into a play would be the the scenery because they do go out into some the more yeah. remote areas. But the parts that were done in in in, in I, I think Mumbai uh, into the very um, you know it, setting the scene would be the hardest part. But yeah. other than that, yes, I, there there is a little bit of a theatrical element to this. Um, but that could have just been a, a vibe. Yeah. No. Because the, what I took away from that, McMullen is excellent at taking a singular image, which may not be the predominant image of a production, and yet in his hands, you get a very, uh, a very good sense of what you're in for, and that cover did that for me. Like I, like things you mentioned were not a surprise just because of the cover image that was presented. There's and that's a very the, that's a very peculiar talent. In the first <laughs> issue alone, one of my favorite parts, and it's really how he how he coaxes the guy into signing on for him. There's like a three page story, a, a, a inner story of how to make a certain type of chai tea mm-hmm. that this person's grandmother made, and it it, it is it, you know it goes into how to boil the milk and how you do a double boiler and just it, like the way that they talk about food is almost it's almost sexual like it's almost spiritual to a point right like it is it is sensual um, but it's also like you're talking like the way they talk about food is like talking about family history um you know to to some degree so it's and there are several moments like that in the book so high 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 watermark uh, on this one I was um, not expecting to talk about James McMullen on this podcast. See, it's <laughs> well, we got John Coltrane, James McMullen. Yeah. I, so I, I've been kind of falling down on my uh, on my duties with the uh, um, with the comments, but uh, Vic Thor Rose, who also is joining us on YouTube, um, on the N Word of God by Dukes, uh, he did, you know, say here death sounds interesting. So uh, thanks very much. Um, and then also Daniel Williamson did say. Uh, great show, by the way. So thank you, TLP. Uh, I listen to podcasts, but not watch live before Green from Finland. Oh, oh hi. hi! That's awesome. It's really late or really early there. So yeah. I, I <laughs> hope we didn't scare you off with our our faces here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, I'm going to go back to Big Two Talk. Uh, it's not been a secret. I've talked about this on this show that I've been dealing with a waning interest that I've had in comic books. And with that, I have a huge backlog. Um, So I'm starting to whittle it down. And I'm, you know, again, because DC is the majority of my reading at this point, um, I'm attacking, I'm attacking the number ones right now and taking it from there. Um, And there was a number one that I really enjoyed uh, there was also a number one that I read that I didn't enjoy nearly as much, but there was enough of a hook to keep me in and keep me interested in what goes beyond this. Uh, the first book I want to talk about is Wonder Woman number one. Uh, I think this came out what, what, like November or so. Is yeah, about, just about just about November. four months ago. Yeah, yeah three four months and ago. You'll see there a new era begins, and this is the era of Tom King as the writer, and Daniel. Is it Semper or Semperi? Does anybody know um, how that's pronounced? On art, he does a stunning job. Yeah, he does. He does a stunning job, and he's asked Gorgeous. to do a lot. He's asked to do very. Um, very bloody moments, very action oriented moments, very geographic moments. I mean, there's a depiction of the Washington monument. That is probably the best depiction of a real life, um, a real life facility ever in comics. And I, I'm not, you know, I'm not blown smoke up and, you know, uh, um, being grandiose about that. It's that good. Um, So what happens in, Wonder Woman, what happens in this new era? Okay, the story begins not in Themyscira and not in Washington, D.C., but in a bar in Montana. Yep. And uh, a woman there is trying to finish up a game of pool, and she finally f- finds herself on the receiving end of some unwanted male attention and some harassment. 
it turns out she's an Amazon and, or at least is believed to be an Amazon. And she kills every man in the place. The only two survivors of the 19 people that were in that bar are the two women. And this hits um, a vibe in our country. And I have to say our country because Tom King captured the weird ass zeitgeist of our current political climate so perfectly in this. So it is our world. Um, Congress passes the Amazon Safety Act because there is this uproar about what happened. And it bars all Amazons from U.S. soil. Now, the thing is, Amazons have, you know, gradually become part of our culture. They've had an embassy. Um, and with this particular story, we see that there are Wonder Woman of the stories of the past that are canon. The first Amazon attack is definitely canon. Um, so there's some, you know, some things that are cleared up there about where this stuff comes in. Uh, and to basically enforce this act they put together and this is a, a great um a, a great use of uh of lettering here the amazon extradition extradition and extradition entity axe acts to remove those amazons that don't comply most amazons do comply uh, with queen nubia's request that they peacefully leave but some people have some of the amazons have formed a life in in the states and they are hesitant or and they're trying to find legal means to stay in the country boy that sounds like ice doesn't it yeah um, <laughs> yeah um the uh the person who was put in charge of this is actually an old charlton character sarge steel um and in a very economic way, Tom King presents this uh, this man as somebody who is almost Amanda Waller's equal and basically pulls the same kind of strings uh, within the, you know, the, the you know, the, the more um, covert areas of our government. And um, some of his agents, uh, you know, deal with a... a uh, an Amazon married couple and in a suburb and it is brutal. It's just brutal. Um, there's a period of tension that goes on. So like weeks, maybe a month has passed and they finally, uh, the ax agents finally meet up with Diana in a cemetery. And she, that's one of the pictures there. And she is in full Diana mode. Um, this was some of the best dialogue I've ever read in a comic about how it's almost a ballet, how she wipes out uh, her adversaries. And she uh, approaches Sarge Steele and tells him, you know, something's not right. Something doesn't seem right. We don't know if this woman was an Amazon. Um, she doesn't seem to be um, you know, part of our records. Um, or if she is one, she's using an assumed name and, you know, let's work together. He immediately rejects that and, and she kicks ass there. Uh, Steve, can you also show the next um, slide there uh, with her? Um, and, you know, he's a condescending uh, piece of male shit and he's calling her girl, uh, even uses the B word. And that's her response. And it's Diana to a T. Um, behind the scenes, though, uh, there is this entity uh, that appears to be pulling the strings of this, an entity known as the Sovereign. And with Diana's uh, being royalty, it seems like this might be a lasting adversary for her. Now, I think even the biggest Wonder Woman fan um, will agree that out of the Trinity, she has the least impressive rogues gallery least impressive group of of um of adversaries yeah um with this you know this may be her court of owls the sovereign um uh, this was a beautifully paced book beautifully written book beautifully drawn book um 
going to there. I f- forget the guy's name. I know his last name is Maury, but his colors are sensational choices throughout the lettering by Clayton Klaus. You know, everything is firing on all cylinders uh, with this first issue. And that's the one thing I have to say. This is a first issue. Tom King is very cognizant that this is a number one issue. It's not the first chapter of a trade paperback. It's a number right. one issue of a comic. And I think that's a dying art. I think that's a dying understanding. And it's nice to see that it's um, um, in play here. Um, it does take chances. Wonder Woman doesn't appear until page 20 out of 39 pages. That's her first appearance. And you don't mind it at all because of the way um, the, the, the story is structured and how the pace is set up. Um, I think this was a great start um, to what I think will be uh, a very memorable run. And I'm really glad that this was the first number one that I pull out of the box. So yeah. uh, I think Caleb's read it. And Steve, you were kind of shaking your head like you had read it too. So I have, uh, I have not read uh, all of them. I have them again in a stack to read because yeah. um, I'm behind on almost all my DC books, yeah. um, except for uh, except for Sandman, um, Wesley Dodds. I think that's the only one that I'm caught up on. Um, <laughs> so I, I have read this, and I just I could just echo everything that you said. This. So look, I am a huge wonder woman fan right like she as far as dc goes she's my favorite character in dc i mean i i I love some superman too don't get me wrong but i she i I do gravitate to her and um she is not always given the writers that she needs right she she's you know there's not a lot of just when you step back she's had good moments over the past 10 15 years you know yeah, so I mean, Cinderella so, and Rucka's return. I mean, she has, yeah. had, yeah. you know, some very good people associated with her. She's had some good, and she's had some some lows. Oh yeah, like, oh yeah, Meredith or not, Meredith Fence, Jesus fucking Christ. And and, and look, I, I'll go to back for this guy in a lot of. I go to back for this guy in a lot of context, but not this one. But Steve Orlando's Wonder Woman was not good. Um, no. You know, Becky Cloonan and, and and Michael Conrad um, was not great. You know, it was it was serviceable, but overall, that's what I think about when I read. You know, most Wonder Woman comics are serviceable, right? I mean, obviously, you've got you've got Perez, right? You you've got Azarello, you've got some standouts, but you don't have nearly the the evergreen titles that you yeah. you see in in the other members. And uh, I think it's something that could be said because it like her highs are so high, yeah, that even like an average book probably is viewed down here, yeah. Because some of the highs are so high, yeah, and and it's inconsistent, yeah. right? Like it is, it is, it is. I mean, it's so valid. dependent upon the you know the perception of Diana is so dependent upon the reader, uh, the it writer. Is. It's very dependent upon there. And, and I really do love her. With this, I think Tom King really understands the psyche um, of of that character. Uh, like you said, Tom King. I, I enjoy Tom King's work. I, I always have. I, I think he's fantastic. There's a lot of people that that you know just. For better or worse, don't. Um, I, you know, especially when it comes to a 12 issue series, very few people can do what he can do. Um, I've read up to the, I think, the fourth issue of this and just has really locked me in, is telling such a dynamic, impactful story. And, and it doesn't stop. He carries over the tone and the action through that you get in the first issue. He just keeps it going. Um, he, he fleshes things out. It, you, he, he runs you through the emotional gamut. Uh, and and he tell and he's fair, right? Like he he's uh, he's not making like, again. I, I've used I've overused this word, but he contextualizes a lot of things. Like there is, you know, there are things that have to be done that don't put Diana in a great light, but they need to be done. And there are things that, that where she's not the the hero, right? Mm-hmm. You know, it, it almost is to some degree he's playing into this. Uh, something I would, I would relate to the theory of like the consent of the governed, Like the hero is only the hero. If the people think that they're a hero. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and when, when you're persona non grata for an entire country uh, and you've been kicked out and demonized and you know, the, the things that you've done before don't tend to matter. Um, at least for is in the court of public opinion. So he, he plays with that. Um, but at the end of the day, she is, 
in, in in their hands, she is a daunting figure. She is some. She is a, a a woman who is not to be trifled with, and she is an absolute force of nature. Uh, and I love every minute of it. Like yeah. I like. And I think I'm, for I'm, a I'm, character I'm, that basically wears the American flag, this is about as America in 2024 as you can get any it, piece. Of, yeah. Any piece of work, any piece of artistic work. Yeah, you know, I was so impressed with this. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's, it's so beautiful. beautiful. Okay, my next book I don't rank as highly, um, and I have my reasons, but uh, there was enough to talk about and enough to keep me interested. Um, so the next book I want to talk about, and Steve, if you have a graphic, I'm such a TV producer, I should have gone that route. Um, I go into... Um, Outsiders number one, uh, the writing team of Lansing and Kelly, uh, who basically, I, I, this is their, is this their first DC work? I believe it might be. I'm not sure. Um, first together or just first period? Um, well, it's not Andy Lanning, it's, it's Jackson Lanning. Um, Lansing, uh, Lansing, sorry. Yeah. Lansing. Uh, I think if you, I'm not sure. Anyway. Um, if they did something, it wasn't that notable. Anyway, <laughs> so here we have an Outsiders number one. Again, the Outsiders began life as Batman's offshoot team after he got pissed at the, the Justice League for not intervening in Markovia because Lucius Fox was captured. That's what happened. Uh, so we have here a team. Um, you'll see one of Caleb's favorite characters, Kate Kane, Batwoman. There's so much. It's, it's, I, I'm so sad that you started off with this book saying you, there were things you didn't like. There, I love this book. But I think you'll agree with, I honestly think you will agree with some of my points. Okay. I, I will, but it just, I, there, there's so much about this book I love. Okay. Um, you have Luke Fox, who goes in and out of his guise of Batwing. Uh, you have Lucius Fox, his father, who is basically a member behind the scenes. And that new character uh, that you see there is known as Drummer. Uh, this is a brand new character who basically talks to architecture and has some <laughs> other strange powers and is actually older than everybody else pictured there. It's, um, there's some. Again, Caleb, I'm only going on the first issue, but um, <laughs> uh, that's what I think I can say about it. She talks to history. Let's put it that way. Uh, so uh, yeah, we, we've seen something like this before. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah but I think you're going to be yeah. you're, you're going to mention that towards the end. Of this. Yeah. Um, so uh, we start off and. Uh, Kate Kane is in, you know, a Quarak type of fictional Arabic country uh, in the DC universe. I had to live this line because as, as clunky as I thought the beginning of the book, you won't have to wear the wig, I think is going to be a line that will be forever associated with Kate Kane and this line and this part going forward. Um, Luke and Lucius um, have to rescue uh, a, a group of. Um, a group of uh, team it, it never it, it, Caleb is it ever said that they're Wayne Tech? Do they ever say that? I, I mm, it's been a little bit since I read this, so I don't remember. I don't yeah. think so, but it, it kind of applies that. Like it, yeah. it, it, it very much implies that this is stuff that he had a hand in, and that's why he's yeah. there, right? Like he's yeah. trying to clean up his own mess to some degree. Yeah. So anyway, um, Kate is a little sick of all the battleground the, the you know there seems to be a different war in gotham every month uh she's a little tired of it and um oh, okay thank you steve for that i guess lansing by himself has you know nothing stood out that's for damn sure um so um uh luke ap approaches kate and he wants to put together a team that really are outsiders they're not there to be a superhero team. They're there for knowledge uh, and to figure out strange situations. And the first strange situation that they encounter is this, uh, is the excavation of a mysterious vessel in the Arctic. Um, it turns out that this is a, this is some kind of multiversal starship. Um, and while it's unclear 
they identify the entity uh, who, who refers to him, her itself as carrier. And Steve, if you can go to the next slide, I mean, I thought this was just a a wonderful mechanism to explain what's going on here. I was a home to heroes. There were victories within me. There were friendships inside me. Uh, there were weddings in my heart. Um, one of my absolute favorite comics of all time was an issue in the eighties of secret origins where, uh, it was told two of the three stories were told from the perspective of the justice league's uh, original cave and the legionnaire who ended up becoming the clubhouse. And this may sound like completely wanky, but um, they're, they're absolutely beautifully constructed stories. Um, So I have a soft spot and talking to history and geography ties into a, a a book that Caleb, um, talked about an omnibus a few a uh, few months ago uh in the dc universe so um in like as not in superhero fashion instead of battling uh this excavated vessel uh that has taken over the bodies of as you'll see there the the crew that was there um they reason with it and i think that sets a very nice tone for where this book is going to go and then, Steve, if you can just keep going with the graphics, the last panel of the first issue, and we see a reference to something. There was, there's a, a very big authority reference um, in the book as well. Um, and I don't think, I think out of all the concepts that did not originate with DC that came into DC's fold, you know, quality and Fawcett and Charlton, the most abrasive integration so far has been Wildstorm. Yeah. Um, But this really worked very well uh, on that basis. Um, The downsides to this, uh, some of the dialogue in the beginning was yes. You know, it was like you know think of like a like a like a c grade spy movie from the the like maybe like late 90s um when luke is drafting kate into this operation could have lifted it from that and that probably would have been better than what we got um the art is is not necessarily distinctive um there were moments i did like but it felt um clunky in many parts um the use of uh you know since we don't have thought balloons but we you know we have um sequences in the story that come from one character's perspective or another it didn't work here it shifted like like it was just too um too clunky i keep going back to clunky um and um switching back and forth to between whose perspective whereas with wonder woman number one it was perfectly executed yeah but there was still enough that i enjoyed there really was there was still enough that that kept me um wanting more and uh so i guess that did its job well so so i read the first three issues all at once right i, I let them stack up and i had no i like I had no idea what to expect from this. I just picked it up because Kate Kane was on the cover and I was like, yeah, no, I'm going to read this because it's my girl. Uh, but uh, So I got it. And I, I read the first three issues. And so maybe I had less of an issue uh, with those kind of things that you're talking about. Cause I read it in a bigger, and it does feel like towards, I would say even towards the first issue, but towards, you know, the second and third issue, like they find their way. And so it, to, I, I think if, if you're reading it, it will become less clunky. Uh, okay. or, you know, you, you, those, those things, they, they kind of find their groove, so to speak. Yeah. But also it's, it's because it's, I, I think they're, they're, they're trying to set it up and lead to a certain spot. This book is inherently planetary, right? Like this book is, they, they, they're not just, just, just t- tapping into it. They're bringing it full force in. And yet, would you agree with me? This book, and this may be become where they where this team has just come from. Also has a very Marvel feel. Little defenders, bit. defenders. Yeah, but it defenders isn't that cerebral. 
This is no, far no, more than the defenders. Some of the some of the latest defenders, like I'm thinking. Oh, okay. I'm, like, I, I'm still thinking of like Hulk. Oh, not, not, the, not the old like the, the old one, but pretty girl. Like whatever. the post Hickman, oh, you know, <laughs> defenders. <laughs> still my and, defenders, you know. Well, and, and like defenders beyond that just came out that dealt with yeah. like the Beyonders and and you know the, that I will agree with you because uh, yeah. like, you can understand my defenders is seventy defenders. So wow, well, yeah, yeah. Really Ghost Rider. And, but, I, yeah, I know what you're talking about. This does have like, but even you know, has a Guardians feel, has an Avengers feel. Yeah. This felt very Marvel to me it, too. It, it, yeah. Who's the Doctor Strange that, corollary here? That is, detrimental um well it just, I, I think i i think the reason that is is because part of the book they 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 get into some of the the human issues right like these 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 are these are not superman and wonder woman this is not batman these are not the the yeah. the, the iconic god figures these are like kate kane has always felt a little bit marvel because she's somebody that struggles with real life you know so like she yeah, she's i don't got, i don't buy that i don't buy that um i i would have bought that uh, up to like 86 um yeah, I don't, I don't, I, I don't see Marvel as having um, a claim on that. No, I. But, but in this, like, when I think, I, I and I mean, like, modern Marvel. Sure. I mean, sure like, yeah. I, okay. So that's, like, you're talking about mar- modern Marvel. I, yeah. I think that that character, like, she's not somebody that has struggled with reality, which does separate her from like Superman and Wonder Woman. But to to me, like, again, the last Outsiders book I read was Red Hood and the Outsiders, uh, which would, had Bizarro and Athena in it as with red hood so like i i think there's there's a little bit of a relation of that to taking these kind of tertiary characters and throwing them into all these weird different things um but for like when i realized what they were doing with planetary like my just like blood pressure went up and <laughs> i i tore through and tore through those three issues uh and I was like, okay, don't do that thing where you just touch on it. And then just, if you're going to do it, do it, right? Go all in. And they do. They go all in with it. It is it is fantastic. I'm giddy over this. Um, and, and, and please, please never let Batman appear in this book. Actually, there's no need to, right? Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's no need to. Keep it. Uh, who, who would I want to see in this book? Um maybe zatanna like dude come zatanna yeah. showing up to do something weird um maybe uh rip hunter yeah i could see rip hunter oh yeah yeah um, yeah rip hunter would metamorpho yeah i could see metamorpho showing up in this to, to some degree right doom patrol yeah i mean it's yeah the, the edge like, this is about the the, edge. the weird ones yeah the weird ones yeah which, which is again, feels like more recent defenders. Like, let's get some weird ones in here. And yeah. and we'll and we'll again, again, Caleb. Like, though I don't come on the positive end of um, a recommendation, I'm definitely someone that wants to see where this goes. Yeah, I can see that too. I like you haven't read past the first issue though, right? Nope. I'm curious to hear your thoughts once you once you read a couple issues in. Because okay. I, like I, I, again, I don't want to make any predictions on what it'll be. Like, I, like it, it could go either way. But for me, I read it all like the first three issues in a chunk. Like I said, and it, that that really framed everything for me. Uh, and, and seeing where it's going and getting a big chunk of it at once, and just really being able to immerse myself in what it is, and just get really excited about what they're doing because they're doing it well. Um, because I would agree with you, like the integration of the Wildstorm stuff was not great. And really the only characters that they've done with it and made work, it's not even characters. It's really just Midnighter. It's not even Midnighter and Apollo. Um, um, to, to some point it is like, I love Steve Orlando stuff. Right? Yeah. But, like I would, I would sort of agree with you. I do think that some of the grifter stories in urban. Yeah. Legend, grifter. Yeah. I Ish, think that you grifter but, right there. Yeah. 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 He's the closest one, but yeah. But you uh, know, it's like you know, Stormwatch was um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that was like a new like I read the new fifty two Stormwatch. The new fifty two Stormwatch, yeah. It, it just doesn't work. Yeah. But the yeah. the 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 wild storm, the one that uh they tried to bring it back um and give the it some Atlas led. Yeah, yeah, give it some little pop. I like that. Not many other people did, but I thought it was interesting. Yeah. So. Okay. 
Well, yeah. we're past the two hour mark, uh, and I was not surprised by this because we haven't seen each other on in this format in three weeks. So, and, yeah. and like longer than that because Caleb was gone from the last episode, yeah. I was gone right. from the episode before that, apart from the end of it. Uh, so, um, I'm glad we got this. I'm so glad we had this time together. I've missed you guys, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so we're going to start wrapping this show up regardless, though. And uh, when we do wrap an episode of the Comic Book Bears up, we have two segments that come towards the end. The first is where we show off our geek gets. Now, um, the guy that always claims he never has one has already showed off one of his, which is that beautiful X-Men 97 poster that Steve's going to tell us about right now. I got it from my store. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I just, I, I, I usually, you know, um, my local comic shop, which is actually 90 miles away from me, um, that I go to every week, uh, he will hold aside, you know, interesting posters that he gets and, uh, just kind of like throw them in my bag when I get my books. So, uh, this was one of them and I was really excited about it, but I also, uh, you know, Bill and I both do this. We go whenever, um, you know, say McDonald's has a promotion with their happy meals. Uh, that's vaguely DC related. Um, we will uh, definitely pick these up. And I actually, the first time was a was a bum deal. I ended up getting Pokemon cards instead. But oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, but they are doing multiverses uh, right now promotions, and you get these really fancy tins that have a you know WB or Cartoon Network figure on the back, and uh, you know, and a DC character. And it's, it's to promote a video game that did get released, I think, last year sometime. Uh, but then they pulled it because they had a lot of work to do on it. Um, and they are bringing it back. So they wanted to release these things. And basically what's in the tin is just puzzles. They're two-sided puzzles. And they have like uh, just a collection of the different characters that you can play. Steven Universe, Wonder Woman, Batman, um, Arya Stark from Game of Thrones. Like just anything that's a WB-owned property. Uh, gets kind of thrown together in this, but it is they're really cool, they're very neat, and uh, you know, just cute. So that's what I got. That's yeah, I have to say, with McDonald's, like I haven't gotten any of these because I've been eating salads for lunch. Um, I have to do what I gotta do. Um, but McDonald's made a um, a push to uh, use more recyclable materials in the packaging. Um, and just before this, they've had like effectively blind boxes, which avoided the use of, the, of plastics for the, the, the tearaway packaging. And that's a really uh, intriguing way to continue with that by using the metallic. That's cool. Yeah, I like those. Yeah, cool. So, Steve, if you can get any extras, I'd, I'd appreciate it since I'm really not going. I, I actually I need to go back because I haven't gotten any for like over a week now. Yeah. Uh, usually I try to get a, a, like all those, use all my points on free happy meals. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> I should, I, I'll pick up a couple more this week. Hopefully my points always went to the McMuffins. All right. Oh. Anyway, um, over to Caleb, Caleb, let's see what your geek gets are. All right. So last week, um, late or maybe late the week before that, I went to think to myself, you know, I really like Florence and the machine and I've been learning some Florence and the Machine songs on ye old bass back here, and it's a fun time. And I was sitting downstairs with the girls uh, while they were, they were playing like something on TV, and I was like, you know what? I want to listen to a certain song. Let me pull out the record that that's on. And I went to grab it, and it's not there. And I was like, what? That's not right. There's Florence I don't own. So I pulled up the Florence discography, and turns out there's two albums that I didn't own. I can't have that. So I fixed it. I fixed it and got two Florence and the Machine albums in last week. And mm. so I now have, uh, other than the live albums, um, I now have her full discography that, that Florence and the Machine have put out. So those are my geek gets uh, over the past couple of weeks. So always in the mood for new music, uh, and I'm always in the mood to add to my collection. So um, I now get all of the Florence. All right, cool. I'm going to echo Caleb in format. And... Um, Part of this was inspired by going around to record shops with our friend Tito um, while he was here. So uh, there were a few uh, vinyl albums that I got over the last three weeks. Um, as massive as a Who fan as I am, 
I have never had a copy of the debut album in the with the British cover uh, of my generation in the States. It was known as the Who Sing My Generation. I've had a copy of that for like 40 years, but um, I've never had um, a ver well, I have digitally, but that doesn't count. Um, so, um, so this is the Who's debut album from 1965. Just a, a just one of the best covers of all time. You you already know what you're in for it a little bit here, um, with just this beautiful mod uh, clothing that they have. So um, finally have a copy like that. Uh, an album that I've listened to so many times over the last nine years that I did not own physically uh, is the debut solo album by Jamie XX of the XX. And uh, I got a copy of In Color. And th this is how long our, our podcast was, Steve. Uh, that was one of the major tangents that Matt Brossard and I went on when this album came out. Uh, just talking about how Loud Places <laughs> was such an amazing song. But after nine that's years, wild. I finally have a copy of that. And then um, in terms of stuff that's new, uh, Tank, uh, the new album by Idols. Uh, I have a copy of that, which is an amazing album. Yeah, yeah. First time they've used uh, an outside producer. They used um, Goodrich, who worked with Radiohead, and mm -hmm. um, it works. Uh, there's some really interesting choices sonically in this that I don't think they could have. Um, I'm not sure if they could have achieved on their own. Um, so, got that too. So, music. It's a fun well, thing. Well, we have a, I have a couple notes here. Um, so uh, Victor Rose was going to be uh, checking out The Outsiders at his local comic shop. Oh. He wanted to mention that. Uh, and then Daniel Williamson, in reference to uh, the music here, oh. uh, he started listening to Jason Isbell after uh, we recommended him. So, cool. yeah, that's, that's cool. Thank that's you. Cool, so Daniel. it's not just that's comics cool. that people come to watch your show for or listen to us. Uh, yeah. They also listen to music recommendations from you guys. I'd say you guys, because I, I never recommend music. <laughs> All right. Uh, so we're now going to move on to our final segment, and that's something we call the Woofs of the Week. In the bear community, if you find a fella attractive, you woof at him. And we do something very similar where we woof at something which may be a comic book or comic book related, but it may also be a TV uh, show or a film or charitable initiative, anything under the sun that we think you, fair listener, or viewer may be interested in sampling. I'll start as I always do with Steve. Steve, what is your Woof of the Week? My Woof of the Week is a funny, weird British show uh, that just started back uh, for season three. So if anybody's ever watched any Kunk on Earth or Kunk on whatever British history, um, Diane Morgan is the actress. She's a hilarious comedian. I love her stuff. And she has uh, another sort of character who is very unique and interesting called Mandy. And uh, this is the third season that Mandy is in. They're, you know, usual quick six episode seasons, uh, you know, over in the UK. These are about like 15 minute long episodes. So they're pretty short, uh, really easy to watch. They're hilarious. It's surreal. I mean, there's, there's stuff that happens in these shows that uh, in these episodes that is completely unrealistic and ridiculous. Um, and she has a perfect characterization. She characterization. She does not break character. This Mandy character, it is fully realized. She's ridiculous and also somewhat lovable. Um, but uh, yeah, I totally recommend Mandy uh, just released season three on BBC iPlayer. So if you have access to BBC iPlayer VPN, or if you live in the UK, um, you can see it uh, completely. They just released all six episodes for season three. Um, or you could go back and watch seasons one and two. I don't know where this is available in the U.S. So um, if you can find it, great. If you're in the U.K., lucky you. Um, or if you know somebody with a Plex server that happens to have all of the episodes, you can, you know, find them. <laughs> but yeah, Mandy. Cool. All right, over to Caleb. Caleb, what is your Wolf of the Week? So I'm going to follow in the Steve vein here and talk about a television show that I just wrapped up, um, specifically on Hulu, and that is Shogun. Now, if, you, if you've seen this show or not, 
uh, if you're into samurais, if you're if you're into 17th century feudal Japan, if you're into the influx of the Western world into that uh, that environment, but you don't want like the last samurai version of it, this is for you. This is very much uh, taken from the 1979 novel by James Clavel, which uh, immediately I have not read. I need to. Um, but it just kind of shows you what's going on in that world. Um, all of a sudden, a uh, an English uh, sailor shows up shipwrecked with his crew on the shores of Japan, um, and they're not supposed to be there. And no one really knows how they got there or what they're doing there or what's going on. Um, but it's it's a very much a show of political intrigue, because while this is happening, what you also come to find out is that the Catholic Church, who is at war with, you know, Spain and Portugal are at war with England at the time. It's the Protestants versus the Catholics and that same old song and dance. Um, they have actually developed trade routes with Japan by this time and they're keeping it very hush hush and very secret. Well, now, you know, a sailor who, with uh, maybe some uh, secretive intent, uh, some clandestine intent has showed up with a boat full of cannons and, uh, you know, it, it is about to turn the tide um, or at least throw a wrench into the machinations of the Catholic church uh, which, by the way, has got a strong footprint now. Um, you start to see there is no shogunate, right? That's a big problem. And so you have all of the uh, lower cabinet um, who are trying to work together to to fill the gap. Um, and some of them are Christians and some are not. It's very it's it's very West Wing meets samurai culture. And I absolutely loved it. And they did a really good job of avoiding like the again, the, the white knight trope, right? Like this dude is thrown in there and he's got some shit to do and some things to say, but he's not the the super super savior he's just kind of like trying to survive and you know learning their culture and the words and uh, how not to die basically this it's a big thing for him he would like to stay alive as i can imagine that you would so go check this out on uh, on on hulu um be prepared to pay attention as you might expect the vast majority of the show is in japanese you you're going to read subtitles if you want to know what's going on they do break into english they also break into spanish and portuguese in some scenes and so you got to read subtitles you got to pay attention or you will get lost uh, but i adored this show the acting was amazing the 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 costuming was incredible to see this world just brought to life uh, in in the way that they were able to do it uh, it was fascinating. And also the, the main character who plays your English sailor, um, he plays a, a sailor named John Blackthorne. But in the real world, this actor's name is is Cosmo Jarvis, which. Yeah. Very like I, th that might be the perfect name. I don't know if there's a better name out there and it's not a porn name, but his name is Cosmo Jarvis. That's it awesome. It could be a porn name. It could be. I would do porn with him. So, you know, it's just kind of up to him. Call me. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, I, my vote for that would be Shakira flabbergasted, but that's another story. Or, or, <laughs> don't, don't, don't leave Dick Warlock out of this. Yeah. Um, Caleb, did you know that in 1990, I saw the musical version of Shogun that played on Broadway? I did not. Well, I did. Um, uh, the version, the out-of-town previews were three hours and 45 minutes long. It was shortened to about two hours and 50 minutes when it made it to Broadway. Wow. Uh, this was a time where there were various shows that were desperate to be another Les Miserables. Yeah. Um, the woman who played Lady Marico was good. The costumes were amazing. Everything else, la bomb. Oh, that's unfortunate. Yeah, it did not work. Uh, well, one of my favorite characters in the show is not somebody you're supposed to like. I mean, it's just th there's so much in this show that's, yeah. you know, that's it's so it's it's like the West Wing. It's it's like there's all kinds of characters. It's fun. Yeah. That was like one of my mother's favorite books. I, mean, I, I remember never, she finished it and then she was like, I, I like this so much. I'm just going to read it again. I've never read it before. I need to. I need to get my hands on it. And I doubt you've ever seen the Richard Chamberlain TV I haven't no mini series version. Yeah. Okay. Uh, enough Shogun. I'm going to move on to my Wolf of the Week. And Steve, if you can provide the graphic there to accompany this. Um, mine is television as well, but it's a TV documentary uh, from HBO Max uh, that is The Truth versus Alex Jones. And this covers the lawsuits. Uh, and they actually have cameras in the courtroom. Um, 
uh, of the lawsuit by the Sandy Hook parents against Alex Jones for defamation and other charges um, the, that uh, resulted from him claiming that Sandy Hook was uh, you know, it was fate. And um, the part that really got to me, and again, this is, it's very well balanced because they they spent just enough time uh, covering Alex Jones as a phenomenon. They spent just enough time on the Sandy Hook massacre, and then the rest is dedicated to the actual machinations of the trial. This is really well structured that way. Um, on a, I am that Caleb was not part of, but Steve was. They uh, there's a brief sequence where they. Um, interview and discuss some of the other Sandy Hook deniers other than Alex Jones. And I really wanted to murder these people. These are odious, yeah. horrible people. Yeah. Um, uh, but again, the majority of the, the bandwidth is dedicated to the trials and it's a fascinating look into um, what the families were going through, um, what Jones was going through in a sense. Um it's, Caleb, when you do watch this, I would really like to um, hear your input because I was so much more impressed with the um, uh, with the council in Texas than I was with the council in um, in Connecticut. Um, just good lawyering um, yeah. is always fascinating to watch. Um, but uh, you know, again, they do address that. You know, uh, Jones is is not the disease he's you know he's you know, he's just one of the bugs that's going around yeah um you know the, there's bigger problems in this country when uh you know as stated 24 percent of the country believes that sandy hook was faked yeah uh and that the parents were crisis actors um and um you have to be in the right frame of mind don't be in an angry place because you know you might get on the internet and scream at everybody and, yeah. and that's what, basically the, what this is about um so don't be that person um but uh it's, it's definitely a worthwhile watch the truth versus alice jones it's it's on my list it's something that i struggle with just because it, it's it is something that needs to be explored and told <laughs> at the same token it's something that we should not have to have a an in-depth documentary to understand the truth Mm -hmm. um it's 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 yet another thing where it's like i i, I hate that it has to exist it shouldn't yeah. uh yep. there, there are objective truths in this world but as you said people like him are not the they are a symptom they are not the disease exactly. um and the same could be said about larger political figures mm -hmm. Um, before we go just for the visuals for people who are watching this steve i see your shirt is a peacemaker shirt Cool. Uh, so yeah, it's an HBO Caleb, Max peach peacemaker shirt. Caleb, is that an EOC? It is an EOC shirt. Okay. There you go. 2022. And you probably only get the, the beginning of mine, but this is my new Space Wolf. Space Wolf. Space, Space Wolf. Wolf. Yeah. <laughs> we have cool clothes. We do. Uh, <laughs> but if you're listening to the audio, just peek in the YouTube, you know. Just see what it's about. I know still most of the people get this through the audio delivery. In terms of the audio episodes, if you're watching this, uh, we're going to have an episode coming out on an audio basis on Saturday morning and on Sunday morning. And then hopefully this one will come out next week. Um, sorry for being behind on that, um, but we'll get back up to speed. So we're wrapping this up. Again, we are the Comic Book Bears podcast. You can find us on the social medias as Comic Book Bears, apart from Facebook, where we are Comic Book Bears podcast. If you want to listen to us, you can do so by downloading us through Apple Podcasts and catching us through many of the other podcasting platforms. If you want to write to us, please do so by sending an email to comicbookbears at gmail.com. Until next time, I'm Bill Zanowitz. I'm Steve Morey. And I'm the Easter Bunny. <laughs> I'm the Easter Bunny. We'll be back again in two weeks. Take care, everyone. Whoa.